Good afternoon. The next item of business is a debate on motion 15421 in the name of Bruce Crawford on committee budget scrutiny. And I call on Bruce Crawford to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Mr Crawford, please. Signal officer. Uh, President Officer, it's my pleasure to open this debate today as the convener of the Finance and Constitution Committee on our pre-budget scrutiny. Uh, at the beginning, though, can I thank our clerks for doing such a telling job in pulling together a report and my colleagues for the diligent and, and, and collective way we went about coming to our conclusions. I'm very much looking forward to hearing the contributions from other committees on their work. We're making just a little bit of history today with this debate. It's the first one of its kind where the conveners get an opportunity to speak about their committee's pre-budget scrutiny and hear the Cabinet Secretary's response. Today's debate is an important aspect of the new pro process for budget scrutiny based on the excellent work carried out by the Budget Process Review Group. And to provide just a, a bit of context to the debate, the group noted the subject committees had previously very little role within the budget process once they had reported to the Finance Committee on the draft budget. In particular, subject committees did not have a specific role in the plenary debates on the draft budget and the budget bill. This meant that often the findings of the subject committees on the budget were unfortunately not debated by the Parliament as a whole. And as more time is devoted now to the scrutiny of the new financial powers, it was considered important to ensure that scrutiny of the existing expenditure powers was not diluted. The group therefore recommended that this debate take place in advance of the stage one debate of the budget bill, which is of course scheduled for next week. And I think it's worth repeating the four core objectives of the new budget process. Firstly, to have a greater influence on the formulation of Scottish Government budget proposals. Secondly, to improve transparency and raise public understanding and awareness of the budget. To respond effectively to new fiscal and wider policy challenges. And fourthly, to lead to better outputs and outcomes as measured against benchmarks and stated objectives. So in May last year, Parliament agreed the new written agreement between the Finance and Constitution Committee and the Scottish Government, which sets out the new process. We're now moving towards a more outcomes-based approach to the scrutiny of public expenditure. And that builds on some of the previous work which subject committees have carried out as part of their budget scrutiny. And I look forward to hearing from colleagues today in this debate how that work has progressed. And as I said at the time we debated the new written agreement, the biggest challenge facing us as politicians in adopting this new process, I believe, will be a cultural challenge. Moving, for instance, from judging the success based on the number of police on the streets to measuring the actual environmental, economic or social outcomes achieved by public spending. President Officer, having set out some of the context which I think was important, I'll now move on to the pre-budget scrutiny carried out by the Finance and Constitution Committee over the past few months. On more taxation and borrowing powers, have been devolved to the, uh, the committee has rightly focused increasingly on the revenue side of the budget. Our pre-budget report focused on four key documents. Firstly, the Scottish Government's five-year financial strategy. Secondly, the fiscal framework outturn report. Thirdly, Scotland's economic and fiscal forecasts for May 2018. And fourthly, the forecast evaluation report. Now, the first two documents are published annually by the Scottish Government following the recommendations of the Budget Process Review Group, and the remaining two are published annually by the Scottish Fiscal Commission. We welcomed the publication of all four documents as a significant step forward, as well as comprehensive basis for our pre-budget scrutiny. We gave particular focus to the operation of the fiscal framework, which I can safely say is not an easy subject to get your head around, and I think my colleagues on the committee would share that view. We previously emphasised that the budget is now subject to a much greater de degree of volatility 
and uncertainty. In particular, the risk to the public finances from forecast error is very real. This risk can work both ways. It can, be, it can positively or negatively increase the risk to the Scottish budget. If there's a divergence in the extent of any forecast error between the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Office of Budget Responsibility. For example, if the Scottish Fiscal Commission's forecasts are over-optimistic and the Office of Budget Responsibility's forecasts are pessimistic, this would have a negative impact on the budget. However, of course, if the converse proves true, then this would obviously have a positive impact on the scale of the budget available to the Scottish Government. Signing officer, there are some other key areas from our pre-budget report I'd like to highlight as part of this debate this afternoon. Firstly, on population growth. We heard there's strong evidence to suggest that there's a risk to the size of the Scottish budget arising from Scotland's population aging faster than that of the rest of the United Kingdom. In particular, there's a real risk from a higher growth in the old age dependency ratio in Scotland relative to the rest of the United Kingdom. This is because the size of the population is between 16 and 64, and I'm just still in that bracket, which makes up most of the working pop age population is important for the economy and public finances. And because these individuals are more likely to be economically active and working, they therefore generate most of the tax which this Parliament requires to raise. These factors mean that there are a couple of fundamental questions that require to be asked. Whether the Scottish Government has sufficient policy levers to address this risk. And whether the fiscal framework sufficiently recognises demographic divergence. Second officer, the committee believes that both of these fundamental questions should be fully considered as part of the review of the fiscal framework that is due to take place in 2021. Secondly, given the way that the fiscal framework operates, there's a real risk to the size of the Scottish budget if there's a fall in the working age population due to a disproportionate decline in immigration relative to the rest of the United Kingdom. Therefore, within the context of Brexit and different demographic dynamic relative to the rest of the UK, we recommended that the review of the fiscal framework should consider the impact of immigration policy following the UK's departure from the EU, if, of course, this actually transpires. Finally, on forecast error, the Auditor General for Scotland was right when she said there are inherent risks in forecasting tax revenues, because they are based on the extent of underlying uncertainty about the economy, the availability of relevant and robust data, the robustness of the Office of Budget Responsibility and the Scottish Fiscal Commission's respective methodologies and judgments, and differences in methodology and just judgments between the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Office for Budget Responsibility. We understood that forecast error is inevitable, and I think that's something we're going to have to get used to in this Parliament, and that the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Office for Bud Budget Responsibility have a very challenging role in preparing independent forecasts. Second officer, because of the direct impact on the size of the Scottish budget and the need to minimise this risk, we've asked both the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Office for Budget Responsibility to make it clear what their respective methodologies were and how you use the outturn data differently. We need to understand how much of a factor this was in explaining the, the, the differences between their forecasts. To summarise, President Officer, the operation of the fiscal framework needs very close monitoring and risk management to address the potential volatility and uncertainty inherent in its operation. There are risks arising from the forecast revisions, especially where there's divergence in these revisions between the Office of Budget Responsibility and the Scottish Fiscal Commission. And while these revisions might not have any immediate impact on the size of the budget, they may have an impact on the size of future budgets, and this needs to be monitored 
very closely. To conclude, the fiscal complex is complex and there needs to be greater transparency and a wider awareness of the risks involved. The committee will try to continue to shine a light on how the framework is working, beginning with our report on the budget which is published tomorrow. The first outturn figures for MetroMRC for Scottish income tax will be published in July 2019 and will have a direct impact on the size of the Scottish budget. These outturn figures for the financial year 1718 will be reconciled with forecasts made in December 16 and any divergence dealt with in 2021 budget. I told you this is complicated. This will be, though, however, a very important matter, as it will be the first time we will fully see the extent from forecast error. If there's any shortfall, this will need to be addressed in the budget for 2021. Equally, if the forecast error benefits the Scottish budget, the government will be able to draw on this money in the 2021 budget to address its priorities. President officer, can I finish by putting on record the committee's appreciation of the constructive engagement all committees have had with the new budget process. We're all learning and throughout the next year can build on the work undertaken across the parliament to improve budget scrutiny and increase our influence in the setting of the Scottish Government's budget. I therefore move the motion on behalf of the Finance and Constitution Committee that the parliament notes the pre-budget scrutiny undertaken by parliamentary committees. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr. Crawford. And I'll call Claire Adamson, Convener of Education and Skills, to be followed by... Oh, I beg your pardon. No, I don't call Claire Adamson. You must have got a bit of a shock there. I actually call, <laughs> I actually call Derek Mackay, uh, Cabinet Secretary, to speak for the government. That frightened you, did it, Miss Adamson? Mr. Mackay. Uh, well, it would have been a great relief to me, can I say, Presiding Officer, if I didn't have to uh, give um, uh, the government's... Uh, position uh, but I'm actually more than happy to because I agree with the Finance and Constitution Committee convener that this is an important step in a budget process and engagement uh, of the parliamentary committees and what should be a, a slightly less partisan way as we take the committee reports consider them reflect upon them and that's exactly what the Scottish Government has done and I reflect that part of this is about the continuous uh, all year round scrutiny of of the budget uh, and therefore there are probably further inquiries from uh, committees uh, that can progress. But in terms of what has been published, I, I agree with the sentiment of Bruce Crawford in appreciation that all have uh, engaged in a very positive and constructive uh, manner. As Bruce Crawford has outlined, uh, these are the changes to budget scrutiny that were from the recommendations from the Budget Process Review Group. So the principle of year-round scrutiny of the budget is important and I again thank all committees for their consideration and engagement uh, on this. I'll now turn to the specific committee reports and uh, reflect on their valued contributions. So turning first to culture, tourism, Europe and external affairs. On culture, tourism and major events, the Scottish Government has committed to spend some £331 million, which includes the continued investment of a further £10 million in the screen sector, something that I know that the committee was interested in. In 2019-20, the Scottish Government will spend around £24 million on supporting its international relations activity, including the funding of Scottish Government operations overseas. And at a time of such uncertainty across the EU, it is vital that the Scottish Government continues to build on its strong reputation overseas. The Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee's report focused on promoting employment and encouraging fair work including the newly devolved employability programmes and our enterprise agencies. So tackling barriers to work, supporting training and promoting fair work is essential to improving Scotland's economy and providing and improving opportunities for all. So I can confirm that the Scottish Government will provide almost £57 million for that employability and training and more widely the budget will support Scottish enterprise with around £253 million. I fully support uh, the committee's interest on employability programmes and this will be considered as part of a review of employability support services and also boost the economy by providing over £5 billion of capital investment to grow and modernise Scotland's infrastructure. 
And I do acknowledge the concerns on the progress of the Scottish Growth Scheme, and the Government will, as I have committed to do, provide the Committee with an update on Scottish Enterprise use of financial transactions in April. Education is this Government's defining mission, and we remain determined to improve the life chances of the children and young people of Scotland and change lives for the better. And I recognise that the Education and Skills Committee has raised a number of important issues. And within a challenging financial environment, the Scottish Government is firm in its resolve to deliver a world-class education system. Uh, this is why, in, in just one, one moment, uh, this is why the education portfolio will receive a real-terms increase in investment in 2019-20. James Kelly. Mr Mackay for uh, taking the intervention. Uh, you mentioned a challenging financial environment, and obviously uh, the backdrop to that is it's important to make the most of the financial levers. Uh, that he has at his disposal. So can I ask him in a non-partisan way um, if he supports the principle of fair taxation and if he believes that it's fair that SNP ministers in this budget uh, will pay less tax than they did in the previous tax year? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, SNP ministers, uh, ministers of the Scottish Government, just in relation to pay and tax, have taken a pay freeze since 2008 and I think that that's the right thing to do. And in terms of our tax position on income tax, of course, we are not passing on the tax cut for the highest earners in society and not following uh, the Tories on their tax proposition. So I do believe that our tax system is, is fair uh, and progressive. If parties wish to bring to me uh, a full proposition, well, of course, I will look at that. Um, to be fair, the Greens have engaged constructively in the budget. And I look forward to Labour's engagement in that regard as well. Back specifically to education, the budget does commit to the £180 million in raising attainment in schools. Uh, this Parliament is aware that the Scottish Government uh, is investing record sums in investment on funding for uh, early learning and childcare. And this partnership arrangement with COSLA it will be supported by £210 million in the Scottish budget with a capital funding arrangement of £476 million being provided to local authorities over the four years. So we're protecting the investment high on further education and increasing skills development Scotland's budget by £22 million to support the continued growth and expansion of apprenticeships in Scotland. The Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee has rightly considered a range of issues including the wider benefits of environmental spend. The transition to a low carbon economy lies at the heart of our economic strategy and the steps we're taking through this budget ensures that we have a globally competitive, entrepreneurial, inclusive and sustainable economy. And that's why the Scottish budget does include commitments to fund around £59 million of forestry priorities, supporting and stimulating woodland creation as part of achieving the targets in the climate change plan that was debated uh, at committee. We're providing over £20 million for Zero Waste Scotland to support transition towards a more resource efficient circular economy. And we'll make available over £145 million as part of the £500 million investment in energy efficiency, fuel poverty and heat decarbonisation. We'll invest over £50 million in low carbon measures, including the expansion of electric vehicles, charging infrastructure and invest £80 million in active travel. And all of these low carbon activities contribute to our ambitious approach to leading the way on tackling climate change. I appreciate the Finance and Constitution Committee focus on the fiscal framework and the financial risks to the Scottish budget have been laid out by Bruce Crawford and discussed at committee. I recognise the challenge that this presents. It is complex, but particularly the reliance on accurate forecasting and the increased uncertainty that comes from managing increasing demand-led budgets such as a new social security programme. I look forward to working closely with the committee as their experience under the fiscal framework grows and we reach that review point. The Scottish Budget will increase spending on health and care services by almost £730 million and the Scottish Government continues to deliver on its manifesto commitment to pass on health resource consequentials in full uh, despite being shortchanged by the UK Government. But in its consideration the Health and Sport Committee highlighted the importance of shifting the balance of care to community health services and the Scottish Budget delivers in this key priority area. In 2019-20, over £700 million will be invested in social care and integration, and we're investing £941 million in primary care, and our investment on mental health will reach £1.1 billion. These are very significant priorities for the Scottish Government, and the budget does reflect Minister's recognition of this. <clears throat> 
In terms of justice, I recognise the vital role that our justice services provide in supporting all parts of Scotland. So the budget confirms investment across the justice system priorities, including the transformation of our police and fire services. The police resource budget continues to receive real terms protection, and both the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service and the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service budgets will receive an increased resource budget. The significant increase over recent years in funding for community justice and support for victims, including third sector organisations, is maintained and increased further. The Scottish Government values its partnership and close working with local government, working together to support the delivery of essential services for Scotland's communities across the country. And the budget will provide uh, local government with a real terms increase in revenue and capital funding, and the budget will provide £11.1 billion for local government. The Local Government and Communities Committee pre-budget scrutiny report focused on the local government workforce planning and the housing needs for older and disabled people as part of that scrutiny. And the budget takes account of the views expressed and we have been able to protect the funding available to assist registered social landlords in delivering adaptations for older and disabled tenants, maintaining funding at £10 million. And there's wider issues in integration as part of that as well. For Rural Economy and Connectivities report, very close interest in Scotland's ferry services, the lifeline services which are vitally important to supporting the connections across our rural communities. Uh, the budget uh, continues the £10.5 million secured last year to support local authority ferry services. I've considered very carefully the committee's interest uh, from Social Security in relation to the Scottish Welfare Fund. Uh, the Scottish uh, Government works closely with local authority partners in delivering this fund and will continue to provide £38 million in 2019-20 to support local authorities for this purpose, despite the pressures coming from UK Government's welfare reform. That figure includes uh, £33 million for payments and £5 million to help our 32 local authorities administer the fund at a local level. I think we're doing the right thing in terms of building a social security system based on dignity, fairness and respect. Our new agency is now operational and will continue to grow and develop as our further social security benefits are devolved to Scotland. In conclusion, uh, presiding officer, um, we are uh, working uh, on the delivery of the second wave of devolved benefits and our early success is something that the government can be rightly proud of. But in conclusion, I welcome the Scottish Parliament's new approach to year-round scrutiny of the budget. It's a progressive approach to scrutinising spend and the delivery of improved outcomes in Scotland. And I genuinely appreciate the constructive approach that committees have taken. I look forward to that very same constructive approach uh, for all parties to continue as the budget proceeds to deliver the stability, stimulus and sustainability that we are looking uh, to deliver for all the people of Scotland. And I look forward to the rest of the afternoon's debate. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And I now call Claire Adamson, Convener of Education and Skills, to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Ms Adamson, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, and can I welcome this opportunity to speak on behalf of the Education and Skills Committee. And I'd like to pay tribute to the support of my clerks and my committee members. And I hope I can do their um, commitment and diligence justice today. The committee has integrated the scrutiny of budget lines and associated outcomes into its inquiries throughout the financial year. The issues covered range from attainment and achievement of school-aged children experiencing poverty, developing the young workforce and instrumental music tuition. And today I have written to the Scottish Government seeking details on the budget lines in support of the implementation of the Scottish National Standardised Assessments. The committee also undertook scrutiny of the draft budget this month, taking evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, John Swinney, and can, just for clarity, presiding officer, can I say that any reference to the Cabinet Secretary is to the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills and not the Cabinet Secretary who's responding today. I would like to highlight additional support for learning in school education, a significant priority for the committee. The committee published its inquiry, which included a focus on mainstreaming in May 2017. The importance of sufficient resourcing of the policy set against a marked rise in the number of pupils recognised as having an additional support need in some areas were underlying themes of the inquiry report. Spe specific recommendations include a financial review of local authority spend, improvements to the baseline data that effective scrutiny of policy implementation needs to be based on, 
and qualitative research into the experiences of young people with additional support needs to assess the reality of the implementation of this policy. The committee welcomed the movement from the government in response to some of its recommendations, particularly in its agreement to commission qualitative research. However, scrutiny of provision of the ASN remains a priority for the committee going forward. In November 2018, we held a session with the government statisticians and policy officials on the collation of data and staff census on school support staff, specifically in the support of children with additional support needs. Changes in reporting reflected inconsistency in data collection across local authorities. The committee would seek clarity on the number of support staff working in ASN previously and currently not available accurately. The committee has looked at funding allocations. The Scottish Children's Services Coalition suggested that there could be ring-fence budgets in support of additional support needs. The committee invited a perspective from the government on this idea. <coughs> I appreciate the arguments made, including by COSLA, during the evidence in our committee's inquiry into music tuition, on guarding against an over-reliance on targeted or ring-fenced funding over funding policy through core local authority budget allocations. Although a report also highlighted the success of the Youth Music Initiative, which is a government-led um, initiative delivered by COSLA and local authorities and uh, thoroughly welcomed by all those who took part in it. The committee also had an inquiry into attainment and achievement of children experiencing poverty, including a focus on the cost of the school day. The committee received evidence, including from the Children's Poverty Action Group, suggesting charging for elements of the curriculum were relatively commonplace. A musical tuition report published on Tuesday highlights the need to ensure that no charges are attached to any activity that is required to contribute towards an SQA exam. In general, we are seeking clarity as to what can and cannot be charged for under the curriculum and more information is required on the extent of such practices in local authorities. The committee has also been concerned about consistency of approach across local authorities, and it continues to be a theme across all of our inquiries. The committee welcomes certain moves to ensure minimal levels of support for children and their families. In particular, the Scottish Government announcement towards the end of poverty and attainment inquiry that it had agreed with local authorities that a minimum level of school clothing grant of £100 per year should be implemented and regularly reviewed, and this was a welcome step. The poverty and attainment inquiry also looked at the pupil equity funding and attainment challenge funding, um, and the draft budget has this standing at £180 million of provision. This included looking at the extent to which indicators of deprivation can be relied upon as the basis for targeted funding allocations. For example, the limitations of using free school meal uptake as a criteria for the allocation of pupil equity funding. And the committee welcomed the Scottish Government's acceptance of the committee recommendations in this area when the Cabinet Secretary made it clear in evidence that he was amenable to finding a better approach and the committee was pleased to hear from the Cabinet Secretary last week that the intention is to have the work completed on a new deprivation indicator in time for the next financial <coughs> year, although we recognise that the implementation of such a new indicator will take a little longer. The Cabinet Secretary also confirmed last week that teachers employed under PEF are employed using the principle of additionality it needs to be used for a new purpose aimed at reducing the poverty-related attainment gap and the need for in-depth evaluation of PEF projects was also highlighted by the committee. This year, the committee looked at the underspends of PEF in local authorities and noted variation le in levels across local authorities of that underspend. Importantly, the Cabinet Secretary confirmed that the underspends can be carried over and be spent by schools into the next financial year. The committee will return to underspend levels the, uh, next year to assert whether the underspend has reduced at the reported level of 40% on the average across all local authorities for 2017-2018. A significant um, a priority for the, the, the government, of course, is in higher and further education. And um, we explored with the Cabinet 
Secretary, the real times are increase in the revenue funding of about 1.3% to £600 million for colleges. And then the intention that this is used to cover the cost of national bargaining and harmonisation. In relation to higher education, the valued status of Scotland's universities and the importance of protecting funding was raised with the Cabinet Secretary. Although the funding is over £1 billion, it is a real terms drop of 1.79% in government funding for universities. And the universities have suggested that they, they expect around £18 million of Barnet consequentials resulting from an increased research spending in the UK and are requesting that this be considered to be allocated back to Scottish universities. An assurance was also sought that the Scottish Government funds that are currently used to support EU students <coughs> would remain in the university sector should we exit the, UC, the EU, particularly in a no-Brexit deal situation. The committee has also questioned why Education Scotland's starting budget at the beginning of the financial year is substantially lower than is required. The Cabinet Secretary set out the logic for in-year transfers and highlighted that the budgeting approach is not specific to Education Scotland and also applies to Skills Development Scotland. However, the committee recognises that Education Scotland, during a time of reorganisation, change and increased responsibilities, should have as much certainty as possible of its funding levels going forward. I'm running out of time, Presiding Officer, but other areas I would like to highlight is the, um, the the, the, the new budget would provide the scope to um, deliver £10 million for compensation for survivors of abuse. Um, the £500 million that's been committed into the expansion of er early years and health care, uh, early years and um, child care, is um, it, of extreme interest to us, especially um, the use of private providers. And we will be watching um, the development of that policy with interest. And also funding to support the achievement of positive destinations for care experienced young people. Um, the committee welcomes the opportunity to have a whole year in line scrutiny of the budget and um, unfortunately I've not been able to mention everything, presiding officer, but I shall leave it there. Thank you very much. I now call Gordon Lindhurst, Convener of Economy, Energy and Fair Work, to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Mr Lindhurst. Deputy presiding officer, a first encounter with the budget process can be confusing for anyone, uh, confounding even, and I'm not necessarily speaking of Bruce Crawford's explanation here today of it. Uh, the thing is, I have been told that it's not really about the figures. They count, of course, it has been explained to me, and they might even add up, one would hope at least, but the focus is more on policy direction. But how can that be? Uh, a question asked in all innocence on the basis of reasoning advanced by the philosopher Gottfried Leibniz, who said that all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Now, I appreciate these are the early days of a new budget process, one that will encourage, we hope, better scrutiny both of numbers and policy, and also a more meaningful input from committees. The best of all possible worlds? We shall see. Now, there are three areas I want to cover today from an economy and fair work perspective. We're not ignoring energy spend. The committee will return to this during what I believe is called full year scrutiny. So let me start with employment support for those furthest from the labor market, a reserve matter until the most recent Scotland Act. Fair Start Scotland supports many disabled people and others at risk of long-term unemployment. And it is delivered by private, third sector, and local authority organizations. In our pre-budget scrutiny report, we anticipated a spend on the program of around 32 million pounds. Now that is a rise of 5%, but the actual figures show the budget falling by 11% between this financial year and the next. This, we were told, was to reflect efficiencies and the removal of transition costs. The Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills assured us frontline <laughs> services would not be affected. And when pressed on the possibility of further reductions, he said, and I quote, probably not. Though the official report shows the Cabinet Secretary weighed in with, and I quote again, never say never. 
So he who holds the purse strings, deputy presiding officer. We also heard from the STUC, SCVO, and Citizens Advice Scotland, amongst others. The key message being that the causes of long-term unemployment can be complex, ranging across childhood experience, mental health, housing, education, drugs and alcohol, and social exclusion. And the resources needed to help an individual navigate such challenges should not be underestimated. And the affordability of that within the given budget is, however, questionable. We questioned the Minister on the matter of one-year contracts awarded under the Employability Fund. We recommended extending this to three years, the same as for Fair Start Scotland. He told us we were, and I quote, moving into a new world. Uh, he didn't clarify whether it was the best of all possible worlds, though I'm sure that he would wish that for everyone. He did, though, indicate the question was under review. I now turn to the second area that I wish to cover, and that is the spend on the enterprise agencies. In response to our report, the Scottish Government appeared to agree with Scottish Enterprises' own assessment of its impact, that every pound the agency spends adds between six and nine pounds of value to the economy. It's curious, therefore, that Scottish Enterprises' budget has shrunk by 27% over the last decade and Highlands and Islands Enterprises by 9%. If the agencies have been so effective in driving economic growth, why take money away? But both will see their allocations cut by a further 3% or so in the next year. To be achieved by running cost efficiencies. Really? After a decade of reduced funding? The committee raised a collective eyebrow. Our report also covered how financial transactions money had boosted Scottish Enterprises funding in recent years. But such monies were limited to equity and loan funding. And Scottish Enterprises struggled to commit some of these funds. Uh, from a pot of 10 million pounds, we found that just half a million of funding has been invested so far. We know that financial transactions make up 30% of Scottish Enterprises budget. But we were not confident it would succeed in committing this year's allocation, never mind next year's increase. The Cabinet Secretary is committed to update us on the bigger picture, the overall £500 million growth scheme by April. And he sought to reassure us on the Scottish European Growth Co-Investment Programme. That is the £10 million pot that it would not be lost from Scotland's public spending. Over the past 10 years, the enterprise agencies have consistently met or surpassed their own targets, while the country as a whole has underperformed against a range of Scottish government targets. The committee was concerned that the agencies not only set, but seemed to mark their own homework. And we welcomed the greater transparency suggested by the role of the strategic board. Its chair, Nora Senior, said the agency's plans would be reviewed by the board and a performance framework was being developed by the analytical unit. She told us, and I quote, the big challenge for the agencies is to reach people who are not yet engaged in the system because that is where the greatest growth could be. I turn now to my third and final area, which is fair work. It was Joe Biden who said, don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. Um, now, I'm not sure that that makes sense, that quote, any more than my understanding of Bruce Crawford's explanation. But, but in any event, there it is. The additional money allocated to the Fair Work budget line was just under £7 million, which, given the Scottish Government's emphasis on the inclusive growth agenda, might seem a modest sum. Patricia Findlay, advisor to the Fair Work Convention, has stated, the value of adopting Fair Work is recognized and accepted, but not mainstreamed. Now, Nora Senior has recommended to ministers that Fair Work become a condition of any support from the enterprise agencies. And the Cabinet Secretary himself told us, and I quote, Fair Work comes first. 
Alas, not everyone is as steeped in these principles as we would wish. We quizzed the cabinet secretary, the minister, and Scottish Enterprise on the Kayam closure. We examined the sequence of events leading to the Livingston-based company entering into administration on 22nd December, and workers being told they were being made redundant on Christmas Eve. We addressed the history of the business, how much funding it received due to due diligence and clawback, and most importantly, we looked at the support available for those who've lost their livelihoods. There seem to remain more questions than answers, and we will consider to look at the merits of a wider piece of work looking at regional selective assistance. Scottish Enterprise might be working in the risk business, but their business is to manage and mitigate that risk. Now, there is some measure of hope in that situation with a number of potential buyers for Kayam said to be in the frame. Will it turn out to be the best of all possible worlds, Deputy Presiding Officer? Hopefully, but we shall have to see. According to Orson Welles, if you want a happy ending, that depends, of course, on where you stop your story. So I shall stop mine there. Rather than enjoying your quotes, your range of quotes. I uh, call Joan McAlpine, Convener of Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs, to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Ms McAlpine. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start, too, by thanking our clerks, our researchers and uh, my fellow committee members uh, for all the work that they've done in this budget process. This debate is a new development in the Parliament's budget scrutiny process, arising, as we've heard, from the implementation of recommendations made by the Budget Process Review Group. The 2019-20 budget marks the first year of the operation of the new process, which is designed to take account of the new revenue-raising powers which have been devolved to this Parliament. While the revenue-raising powers are important, it's important that the expenditure proposals in the budget are also fully scrutinised. And I welcome the opportunity to provide the perspective of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee on the spending proposals which fall within our remit. I recognise that this is the first year of a new process and that will take time to bed down. In future years, I consider that this debate will provide an opportunity to consider how well the new process is functioning in practice. Presiding officer, debates on the budget naturally tend to focus on change in the numerical allocations. Um, Gordon Lindhurst uh, quoted uh, a Republican, a Democrat rather, Vice President Joe Biden, I was going to quote um, Republican President George W. Bush, not someone who I would normally quote, but he once remarked, it's clearly a budget, it's got a lot of numbers in it. Uh, President Bush is remembered for many things, but perhaps not his love of financial detail. However, the purpose of this budget is to dig down into the detail of uh, the, the finances. And for 2019-20, the budget with regard to culture, tourism, Europe and external affairs is essentially a standstill budget. I therefore wish to consider some of the broader policy themes within the committee's remit that the budget seeks to support. Turning first to culture, the new budget process places a significant emphasis on the scrutiny of outcomes. The national performance framework contains an outcome on culture and that is welcome. However, the attribution of outcomes from spend, which is directly attributable to the culture portfolio, is at present at best opaque. The Cabinet Secretary, Ms Hislop, has highlighted that the Scottish Government plans to undertake work to understand how the activities that are directly attributable to the culture portfolio budget contribute towards the national outcome on culture. The committee considers it imperative that work on this issue is concluded rapidly if the committee is to be able to scrutinise the budget from an outcomes perspective. The Cabinet Secretary also highlighted that this work on outcomes will be aligned to the forthcoming culture strategy. The committee has noted that the culture strategy was due for publication last year and as yet that there is still not a time scale for its publication. The culture strategy will provide a key means via which to assess the Scottish Government's cultural priorities and how the budget will support these priorities. Therefore, the committee would welcome a timescale for the publication of the culture strategy. 
Scottish Government support for the screen sector in Scotland has been a key area of scrutiny by my committee in 2018, as the Cabinet Secretary alluded to in his remarks. We therefore welcome the £20 million in support provided to the sector that is maintained in the 2019-2020 budget. Presiding officer, my committee has undertaken considerable scrutiny of Scottish Government policy with regard to the screen sector. The committee considers the sector to have significant growth potential and is ideally placed to be a key business sector in Scotland. Currently, Scottish Government financial support to the screen sector is provided by both Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise. One of our key recommendations in our screen sector report was that these budgets should be brought together under the control solely of the screen unit within Creative Scotland in, in order to maximise the impact of Scottish Government support. Uh, as a committee, of course, we continue to argue that the screen unit should eventually become a standalone agency. At the very least, there is a significant need for Scottish Enterprise to support uh, support to be seen to be more effective in meeting the needs of the sector. And I would welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Finance's view on this issue. Lastly, in terms of culture, the committee recognises the considerable financial pressures that local authorities face in supporting cultural provision within their localities. The committee recognises that the Cabinet Secretary, Ms Hislop, is keen to reconvene meetings with the group bringing together local authority culture conveners through the auspices of COSLA. The committee also shares this objective as a means to encourage strategic dialogue on how best to support cultural provision at a local level. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work has clearly set out that the Brexit process could have significant implications for the 2019-20 budget. The committee recognises this position and will continue to scrutinise the implications of Brexit for the budget within our remit over the coming year. As part of the Scottish Government's response to the challenges that Brexit presents, the Scottish Government proposes to increase the external affairs budget to 24 million from 17.2 million in 2018-19. However, the Cabinet Secretary has confirmed to the committee that this increase is, however, a consequence of total operating costs being included within the budget. The committee would therefore welcome the details of the exact amount of operating costs which are contained within the external affairs budget. The budget also contains details of the funding levels for the international hub offices that are supported through the external affairs portfolio. Importantly, the budget includes an increase in the budget for the Brussels office, reflecting the impact of the Brexit process. Funding for the hub offices in China, Canada, Paris and the United States are also contained in the level four figures for the portfolio budget. However, the hub offices in Dublin, London and the new hub office in Berlin are funded through the finance, economy and fair work portfolio. The committee has explored the rationale for this dual portfolio approach to the funding of hub offices with the Cabinet Secretary, but this remains an area that the committee wishes to scrutinise further in the coming months. More generally, the rationale for the choice of location for hub offices is also an area that the committee wishes to explore further. However, the Scottish, however the Scottish Government evaluates the performance of these offices is another area that the committee has returned to regularly. The Cabinet Secretary has highlighted to the committee that the Scottish Government is in the process of developing business plans for each of the Scottish Government offices. In evidence to the committee, the Cabinet Secretary emphasised that evaluating the work of the offices in monetary terms would be problematic, as much of the work of the offices is in building relationships and influence. Specifically, the Cabinet Secretary, Ms Hislop, said, when we look at the business plans, we will con consider how we evaluate the power of influence in relationships, which is not necessarily done in monetary terms. Again, the committee looks forward to scrutinising these business pa plans once they are published. Presiding officer, lastly, tourism also falls within the committee's remit. As Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry and narrow-mindedness. The budget for tourism is essentially the money which the Scottish Government provides to support the work of Visit Scotland. In 2019-20, the budget for Visit Scotland is proposed to be £45.3 million. 
This is essentially a standstill budget and has been the budget for Visit Scotland since 2016-17. Nevertheless, the committee recognises that there has been a substantial increase in visitor numbers in recent years due to a variety of factors, including the weak pound, as well as the successful promotion of Scotland as a location and destination. Of course, this includes a contribution related to visitors being attracted to locations which have been subject to successful screen productions filmed in Scotland. While this rise in numbers is welcome, the committee also recognises that this can result in significant impacts upon localities. The impact of tourism upon our cities, such as Edinburgh, as well as more rural locations, such as the north coast of Scotland, are well documented. Clearly, the ability of local communities and critically local authorities to respond to the capacity and infrastructure challenges that increasing visitor numbers can present is currently a key debate with regard to tourism. The committee has taken evidence on the proposals for a transient visitor levy, more commonly known as the tourist tax. And to date, the committee has not taken a position on this proposed tax, but we have sought to provide a forum for the articulation of views on this issue. In conclusion, providing officer, as ever, consideration of the budget raises as many questions as answers. The committee intends to undertake a range of work over the coming months, which will contribute to our pre-budget scrutiny for next year, but also enable us to ascertain the outcomes arising from the 2019-20 budget. Ultimately, the budget sets out spending plans, and it will be outcomes that arise from this budget that most concern my committee and indeed the people of Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a, a little time in hand, but I can be elastic. As I said before, not so elastic, it snaps. Um, I now call Lewis MacDonald, who's convener of health and sport, to be followed by Julian Martin. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. When it comes to new ways of approaching the budget, the Health and Sport Committee can claim to have played a leading role. And I start by thanking members of the committee, past and present, uh, as well as committee clerks, for consistently supporting such an innovative approach. At the start of this parliamentary session, ours was, I believe, the first subject committee to build an element of budget scrutiny into all its work throughout the year. We broke new ground too with pre-budget reports seeking to influence the content of the budget rather than reactive uh, reports reflecting on the budget after it had been produced. These innovations were adopted in advance of the recommendations of the Budget Review Group, and it is good that committees generally are now taking the same approach. Committees clearly have an important and distinct role in the budget process, which I, like other committee conveners, will describe this afternoon. <clears throat> it is important, though, also to recognise the limitations on what committees can claim in the context of the budget process, precisely because committees seek to reach a consensus and we focus on the budget in terms of what it does in a specific portfolio. A debate like today's cannot be a substitute for wider consideration of the government's budget by Parliament as a whole. Our input to the wider debate is to inform. Clearly, it is for Parliament as a whole to decide. But in order to deform, inform the debate, we have, as a committee, sought to do three things. To improve the transparency of the process and of the budget itself, to secure better outputs and outcomes as measured against benchmarks and publicly stated po policy objectives, and to scrutinise the Scottish Government's budget proposals and their effectiveness in delivering those outcomes. The health and sport budget totals over £14 billion, a very substantial share of all the funds spent by the Scottish Government on Parliament's behalf. That is why transparency matters so much. <clears throat> the majority of that spending is the responsibility of health and social care integration authorities, typically integration joint boards made up of health board and local council representatives. Back in 2017, the eight billion pound budget allocation to IJBs wasn't even broken down by individual integration authority. That really hindered the committee's ability to fulfill its scrutiny function. And we said so in 2017, we said so again last year. So it is good to be able to report that we now receive quarterly consolidated financial returns from IJBs. The committee has also raised concerns <coughs> about the limited financial information made available for NHS boards. Again, it is good to be able to report that detailed information is now being provided on a monthly basis. That information, of course, confirms the challenges which boards face in balancing their own books, which is why the government has a performance escalation framework which reflects its level of concern or otherwise 
about each board's ability to operate within its budget. The Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport agreed at the committee last week that she would publish, alongside the monthly financial information that we have secured, details of where each board stands on that escalation framework in respect of financial performance. And I think that marks a further success for the committee in approving budget transparency in such an important area of public spending. Beyond the annual budgetary challenges for NHS boards and IGBs, we have also asked whether there are adequate financial frameworks to enable long-term financial planning by health and care providers. In line with the Budget Process Review Group's recommendations calling for a more strategic approach to financial planning, <coughs> the committee has repeatedly recommended support for long-term budget planning. And so we welcomed the publication uh, of the medium-term financial framework for health and social care. We pressed in our pre-budget report for clarification on how the planned £2 billion in additional health spending would be delivered. We requested further information on Barnet Consequentials on the actual amounts of spending and on the percentage increase uh, in spending in particular areas of the portfolio. We are keen to ensure that the budget information published by the government is as transparent as possible and consistent with other documentary evidence that is available. We have repeatedly called for a three-year financial planning cycle, and we are pleased that ministers have now introduced more financial flexibility for NHS boards over a three-year period. That does not yet allow three-year financial planning, though. <coughs> Jean Freeman told the committee last week that all that boards will be told about their baseline budgets for 2020-2021 is that they will not be less than they are for 2019-20. Whether that flexibility goes far enough is therefore a matter uh, to which we must return. <clears throat> Another developing feature of health delivery in the recent past is the development of regional plans for the north, the east and the west of Scotland. The committee asked that these should be published ahead of the budget precisely to improve our scrutiny of the budget itself. <clears throat> it is disappointing that that has not happened, although the Cabinet Secretary has committed to providing these plans within the financial year. The second area which I wish to highlight uh, in terms of the impact of our work in the budget process is in linkages with better outputs and outcomes. For us to scrutinise policy priorities and the allocation of resources, we need to know not just the sums allocated, but also the impacts and outcomes which the investment provides. Integration authorities have made only limited progress in reporting their budgets against the nine national health and wellbeing outcomes to show how the funds approved by Parliament are actually delivering. <clears throat> that is despite a statutory requirement for integration authorities to report on how they have used their resources to achieve outcomes for health and well-being. We have as a committee highlighted our concern about that several times and our pre-budget report again called on the Scottish Government to make clear that developing information linking budgets with outcomes should be a top priority. The Scottish Government has acknowledged on the basis of the available data that there is wide variation in performance and an ambition for change among different integration authorities. That, we believe, needs to be addressed and the committee will explore these issues in more detail once the Scottish Government has published the findings of its own internal review of the current operation of integration authorities. <clears throat> we have also explored the impact of targets within the health service on behaviour and outcomes, most recently with Sir Harry Burns in the context of his review of targets and indicators in health and social care in Scotland. The Scottish Government's response to our pre-budget report states that there is no intention to change targets, <coughs> which appears to mean that the work of this review has now been shelved. If that is indeed the case, this is another area which I expect the committee will want to look at again. The third area I wish to highlight is around the Scottish Government's actual budget proposals. Now, we have not as a committee taken a view on the government's revenue and spending proposals this year, nor have we proposed alternatives, partly because of the focus we have had on the need for more transparency in the budget process and on the relationship between spending and outcomes. We have, though, raised a number of fundamental questions about the Scottish government's investment priorities. One of these areas is on shifting the balance of care. The current government target is that at least 50% of spending will be on health services in the community by the end of this parliament. We believe that 
is not an ambitious target. We have called for an acceleration in the pace of change, and we have called for the Scottish Government to consider setting a more ambitious target. We have also repeatedly asked questions about the NRAC formula, the basis for allocation of funding to territorial boards. The Cabinet Secretary conceded last week that there were issues about NRAC, and she suggested that she was open to discussion about these, which is welcome. Finally, we have explored spending on specific areas, for example, mental health, as referred to by Mr Mackay this afternoon, and alcohol and drug partnerships. We have called for more transparency uh, on funding and on outcomes in these areas, and I'm sure we will return to these specific topics in future budget scrutiny to pursue these questions further. The committee, presiding officer, will seek to continue to make a difference, to increase transparency, to focus on outcomes, to press for budget decisions which support policy objectives, and to assist the scrutiny of future budgets by Parliament as a whole. Thank you very much. I now call on Julian Martin, Convener of Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, to be followed by Edward Mountain. Thank you, President Officer. First of all, I'd like to thank the committee clerks for all their hard work and support as we have undertaken budget scrutiny, and to fellow, fellow committee members particularly for their collegiate manner in all that we do and the support that they've given me as their new convener. The Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee welcomes the focus on national outcomes in the new budget process and the opportunity to engage with the Scottish Government in advance of publication of the draft budget. We've been encouraged by the openness of this discussion. In our pre-budget scrutiny, we explored the opportunities to achieve wider benefits from environmental spend and sought to understand the carbon impact of all capital budget decisions. The decisions we take on infrastructure today will lock in future emissions. Before I discuss the, de the detail of the committee's views, while we welcome the move to include the total cost of delivery, including the cost of administration in each portfolio, and acknowledge the positive impact this will have on transparency in the future, this first year made scrutiny quite difficult. Not having detailed information on the additional allocation of administration costs to our portfolio in 2019-20 has meant it's been difficult to determine whether the budget for our portfolio has gone up, down or has remained the same. But we realise that future years will be easier in that respect. The committee urges the Cabinet Secretary to provide figures on the cost of administration that have now been included in the total cost of delivery to ensure that we can make a like-for-like -like comparison. Overall, we remain concerned that the budget for the environment, climate change and land reform portfolio for the relevant agencies and research has been declining over a number of years, even when we all agree that environmental spend can reduce burdens in other portfolios. The impact of this is apparent when considered against the performance of the relevant national indicators. We're particularly concerned about the budget for research, Scottish National Heritage and Marine Scotland, and would stress the impact of these on delivering key environment, environmental, but also economic and health outcomes. Now on to the impact of uh, EU exit. The potential impact of EU exit is of great concern to us. The finance received from Europe to deliver environmental objectives is considerable. The committee remains gravely concerned that there is still no certainty as to what will replace this following the UK exit from the EU. Any reduction in budgets will have significant knock-on effects across the environmental sector in Scotland and further work in the diversification of funding sources into the sector is vital. We have asked the Scottish Government to continue to press the UK Government to ensure there is no detriment to Scotland's finances and that Scotland maintains the same level of financial benefits that EU funding has provided. We have also recommended the Scottish Government work closely with agencies and partners and the UK Government to identify possible replacement funding streams as a matter of extreme urgency. Uh, the committee agrees with the Scottish Government that investment in Scotland's natural capital is both fundamental to the economy and fundamentally linked to the delivery of health and well-being benefits and to the delivery of the global sustainable development goals. There are significant opportunities to improve key national outcomes including health, well-being and economic growth through investment in our environment and natural capital. The committee agrees with the Scottish Government that the natural environment is currently an underutilised resource. It's also significantly undervalued in terms of the understanding of its value to the economy and societal well-being. In our budget scrutiny, we heard that now is not the time to draw back from investing in the environment and the circular economy. 
Significant health benefits and savings to the health service can be achieved through environmental spend. For example, if 1% of the sedentary population, of which I feel that sometimes we are part, um, were to move to a healthy pathway, a thousand or so lives would be saved and £1.4 billion would also be saved across the UK. For every £1 invested in health walks, we see eight to nine pounds of benefits. When people have easy access to nature, they are three times more likely to participate in physical activity and 40% less likely to become overweight or obese. Active travel is at the heart of Scotland's policies to reduce air pollution and carbon. An, estimate two th an estimated 2,500 deaths in Scotland and 1,500 early deaths each year result from air pollution. If Scotland met its ambition of 10% of journeys by cycle each year, this would also save £364 million as a result of improvements to air quality. And as such, we welcome not only the doubling of active travel, but the creation of low emission zones in some of our cities. We also heard that there's a strong link to lower levels of stress and associated health complications in individuals who live in greener streets and greener urban areas, particularly for people who live in areas of multiple deprivation. The committee recommends the Scottish Government review existing research on the health benefits of environmental spend and, if necessary, commissioning research to underpin future spending decisions. The economic benefits of environmental spend are well documented. Current estimates est uh, suggest that Scotland's natural capital is worth around £20 billion per annum to the economy, including tourism, renewable energy, food and drink and other sectors. The importance of the environment cannot be over overstated. The leverage rates for environmental spend are high, SNH 1.5 million spend on the SRDP and Agri-Environment Climate Scheme generated 47 million of additional benefit. The 11 million pounds received by the Royal Botanic Gardens of Edinburgh from the Scottish Government in 2017 generated an additional 38 million to the Scottish economy and 102 million to the global economy. The Central Scotland Green Network will generate £6 billion to 2050 and has the potential to benefit 70% of Scotland's population. We also heard that investment in managing non-native invasive species could save £200 million a year by avoiding damage to forestry crops and infrastructure. We're keen to ensure that sufficient investment is going into Scotland's green infrastructure, particularly in urban areas, and we encourage the Scottish Government to extend the Green Investment Fund. We heard of the importance of education policy in mobilising teachers and children to access the environment and we encourage the Scottish Government to provide enhanced funding to support outdoor learning. And we are supportive of the Scottish Government's ambition for a transition to a circular economy and heard there are great opportunity, greater opportunities for public procurement to become a pool for new circular economy businesses. The committee encourages the Scottish Government to consider what more can be done to bring forward future work on the circular economy and green economy and provide funding and support packages in, or, in order to fully realise the related benefits. The committee is aware of the need to address the, needs uh, the risks posed by climate change to the environment and ensure it's more resilient to the impacts of climate change. The committee heard that the investment in the National Ec Ecological Network is essential for climate change adaptation. Investment in peatland restoration and the management of water flow contributes to flood protection. And the committee encourages the Scottish Government to extend funding to these in order to achieve the significant benefits. Uh, now to the carbon impact and the carbon assessment uh, of the budget. Um, we welcome the Scottish Government's commitments to increase the percentage of capital spend on low carbon projects and to engage more widely when considering the carbon impact of the budget. However, we're concerned that the infrastructure pipeline appears to have a lower percentage of car low carbon projects. This is something we hope the Infrastructure Commission will address in its advice to the government. Scotland needs to lock in a just transition to zero carbon future now, and this will require a substantial shift in the proportion of investment that's spent in infrastructure that does not can contribute negatively to climate change. We have made a number of specific proposals on how supporting information can be improved, and we're keen to work with the Scottish Government over the coming months to ensure Parliament better understands the carbon impact of all budget decisions. 
Um, we are concerned also about the impact of proposed reduction in the Sustainable Action Fund as this supports a number of new and innovative actions that will underpin much of the necessary success in driving behaviour change and action in new challenging areas. The research budget underpins the delivery of a wide range of outcomes and generates significant additional benefit to the Scottish uh, economy. Um, I'd like to end by putting on record our satisfaction that the committee is now able to play a much greater role in budget scrutiny than has been possible in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Edwin Mountain, Convener of Rural Economy and Connectivity, followed by Ruth McGuire. Mr Mountain, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to be able to speak in this important debate today as the Convener of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. I would like to start off by thanking the fellow members of the committee for all the hard work they put in, supported by the clerks, as we were dealing with a massive amount of work on our schedule. I suppose I ought to, presiding officer, also refer to my members' uh, register of interest in that I will be talking about farming, but I will be doing so as the uh, convener of the committee. I would like to make a comment at the outset, and that is that I personally have grave concerns about the previous financial oversight system used by this parliament of post-budget scrutiny. Based on my experience of the business world, the previous system could not be described truthfully as scrutiny. I believe the new system of looking at areas of interest to the committee before the budget is published in the hope of influencing is, is laudable and I hope that it won't be proved naive, but I believe it needs a considerable amount of work to improve it to make it truly worthwhile. Now the committee uh, chose to carry out the new process of pre-budget scrutiny on the strategic investment required to support the Clyde and Hebrides ferry services. We did this during the whole of 2018 and it was a very focused review. The well-documented problems which caused significant disruptions across the Clyde and Hebrides network in the spring and summer of 2018 helped focus our decision. The problems, more often than not, were a consequence of the unreliable and aged vessels. We were also influenced by our, by our recent scrutiny of the Island Scotland Act, which highlighted the vital importance of ferries as lifeline services and a linchpin for the ongoing sustainability of island communities and economies. The committee wanted to know, when it carried out its scrutiny, whether the level of current and planned investment in ferries and infrastructure met the needs. Nearly all stakeholders we heard from told the committee that ferry services and infrastructure had suffered, suffered from a lengthy period of substantial underinvestment. We heard that the fleet was old, with many vessels approaching the end of their working life, and there was no spare vessels or capacity. We also heard the efforts to purchase a second-hand vessel had failed, and these were likely to continue to fail because of the need for the vessel to have a shallow, shallow draft. 85% of respondents to the committee's online survey thought the current and proposed level of investment in new ferries and port infrastructure was insufficient. And Caledonian Maritime Assets Limited, the Scottish Government-owned company which owns and operates ferries, ports and harbours which serve the network, stated that a significant increase in investment would be required to ensure a properly managed replacement and improvements in, of ports and infrastructure that needed to be programmed. They stated, in their opinion, that a £30 million a year was needed to be invested in new vessels and £20 million in ports and harbours. Over the last 10 years, when quizzed, they proved and said that they had received less than half that amount. Following consideration of the evidence, the committee recommended to the Scottish Government that it should prioritise ferry investment with a focus on procuring new vessels to reduce the average age across the fleet, which would also improve service reliability. So far, so good. The committee had identified a problem, which was supported by evidence. A true opportunity, we believe, for the committee's work to influence government expenditure. In the response to the committee's report, Paul Wheelhouse, the Minister for Energy and Connectivity, said that the island and the islands pointed out what we already knew. We knew that two vessels had been commissioned, the Glen Salux, uh, Sanox and Hull 802, being constructed by Ferguson Marine. No others ordered or confirmed. He did point out to a further 4 million uh, that had been invested in a resilience fund 
to set up to address ve vessel reliability issues. This, we were told, was to allow the forward purchase of fast-moving spares. Fine, of course, I believe, if all the ferries were a standard model, but they're not. And I'm sure the committee will want to monitor how this resilience fund is used in the course of this year. Now, these points were repeated when Michael Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport and Infrastructure and Connectivity, when he be appeared before the committee just last week. Now, whilst the investment is welcome and the delivery of the problem is the delivery of both new vessels is late and due to significant delays. With the Glen Sanets not currently due until summer 2019 and Hull 802 not till the following spring of 220, this means that there will be another two summers at least of disruption. And there was some dubiety when we took evidence on the fact of whether these dates were realistic. Now, Mike Matheson also indicated that planning had been towards the future replacement of the Isla Ferry. Beyond that, there are no concrete plans for vessel procurement, which this committee called for prior to the budget. Now, the committee also called on the Scottish Government to conduct an urgent review of the ferries plan to meet current and future needs. It therefore welcomes the Scottish Government's commitment to a review of the plan, covering both vessels and infrastructure. But sadly, Yes, can I just finish, uh, uh, if I may? But sadly, this is not to be completed before the end of this year and, indeed, next year's budget. Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. It would be, I thank the Member for taking the intervention. It would be unfair to expect a committee response uh, in the way that I'm posing the question, but generally trying to be uh, constructive on the ferries issue. I think there's cross-party interest in the structure of decisions around transport and procurement and, and maybe something committee can assist government with to explore the issue around governance that might help us with some of these issues around delivery. Edward Mount. Absolutely, and, and the committee did carry out a visit uh, to Ferguson Marine Engineering and would like to be involved and to understand how the delivery of ferries is carried out. And we've taken evidence uh, from... Uh, uh, the agencies on the design of ferries and how those ferries are designed, which is actually critical to ensuring delivery is carried out on time. And that's something I think the committee will want to follow up on. But the committee, if I may go back, is very aware that our recommendations prior to the budget in the terms of need for strategic planning backed up by appropriate investment were indeed made by another committee, the Transport and Infrastructure and Climate Change Committee in 2008. However, despite this, this previous work, it still appeared to the committee that we're suffering from underinvestment and lack of strategic planning as far as the ferries. Now, I won't be able to speak for the committee in 2028, but if our views are reflected in 10 years' time, as we are reflecting the views of the committee 10 years ago, I think the committee will find it unacceptable. Now, the proposed new ferries plan, when it is delivered, will provide an opportunity for the Scottish Government to deliver a strategic plan which will give confidence to island communities, business and tourism, and ferry service, and prove that ferry services will fit the purpose and meet their needs, which is critical. The committee, I believe, will closely monitor this. Now, the committee also looked at RET and the recommended that the Scottish Government should reflect on the evidence the committee had received about ways in which RET may be further improved and developed in the future. For example, differential or dynamic pricing and the ability for islanders to take priority, particularly in emergency situations. Now, I'm pleased to note in his written response to the committee, Mr. Wheel has undertook to take this recommend in recommendation into account of the network-wide review of RET which is due to conclude by the end of 2019. There was, however, a genuine concern at the committee meeting that as a result of the recent evidence session that the Scottish Government may be considering, in the short term, fair increases on some routes to help reduce demand. This move, I believe, would be impact most of the island communities who we heard from as part of the island's bill and would be detriment to their future. For a signing officer, I'd also like to mention that the REC committee also took evidence from the relevant cabinet secretaries on the budget as it relates to agriculture and the dig digital economy. This threw up several important issues. This included the reduction of LFAS payments, 
and the investment required to deliver the ambitious R100 superfast broadband project by 2021. On the R100 project, the committee were informed they will have to await the contract, which should have been awarded in next month, which will now not happen till 2019 before we can scrutinise it. But we will be looking to see the £600 million estimated that it will cost to deliver this in future budgets. And I know the committee will take a close interest in this uh, in future matters. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I believe the REC committee responded well to the, way the, new, the new way of looking at the budget. But unfortunately, with the budget that's just produced, we have not seen many of the items that we called for. We look forward to seeing the Scottish Government taking into account the very important matters we raised on critical services to the islands that the ferries produce, and we will look forward to reviewing those in the future budget next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Mountain. I call Ruth McGuire, Convener of Equalities and Human Rights, to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to participate in today's debate to share the pre-budget work of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. The committee has a crucial role in helping to drive forward scrutiny of Scottish public funding to deliver equalities outcomes. Since September 2016, the committee has also considered how human rights could be more explicitly identified through the Scottish Government's budget. The committee's report, published just over a year ago, making the most of equalities and human rights levers, sets the scene. The committee has sought to build on this work. I thank the clerks for their diligence and support in doing this and my fellow members for their dedication in exploring these matters through this pre-budget phase and acknowledge that scrutiny of cross-cutting issues can be challenging and requires sustained commitment over the longer term to make progress. I'd also like to recognise the contribution made by the public bodies, organisations and individuals who shared their experience with us and help us keep the spotlight on equalities and now human rights. The committee appreciates the way in which the Minister for Older People and Equalities has engaged with us and welcomes the carefully considered response to our findings from the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People. The budget for promoting equality is £24.6 million. We note that this is a cash increase of 8.4% on last year. The government has told us that this will be used to respond to recommendations from the advisory group on women and girls and the first minister's advisory group on human rights. The budget line will implement the social isolation and loneliness strategy and deliver a framework policy on older people. It will, as I said, uh, deliver and respond to the First Minister's National Advisory Council on Women and Girls and continue to support frontline services and wider activity to address gender-based violence and inequalities, including a major campaign to challenge sexual harassment and sexism. Because of the cross-cutting nature of equalities and human rights, we note that some of the spending plans come under the portfolio of communities and local government. The committee may have a small budget line to scrutinise, but we have a big role and a significant challenge in looking strategically at the account taken of equalities across the Scottish Government's budget. It's been 10 years since the Scottish Government first published its equality budget statement, a world leader in equalities budgeting, with many countries striving to achieve a similar approach. Equalities budgeting has moved on and the revised budget process offers us an opportunity to reinvigorate the focus on equalities. Starting this year under the new approach, the Scottish Government has committed to publishing additional equalities information prior to the summer recess. The committee welcomes this crucial step forward and encourages other committees to make use of this information to support and influence their own budget scrutiny. This in turn should influence the government's budgetary decisions to deliver equality outcomes across portfolios. The committee understands from the government that work is currently underway developing options on what information could be included. And my committee would be pleased to meet with the cabinet secretary for social security and older people to discuss the various options under consideration. It's important that we ensure Scotland builds on its equalities leadership and we would welcome views of all committees to support this discussion. A key area of focus for the committee is the collection of equalities data. Data is crucial if we're going to be able to successfully measure outcomes. Chris Oswald from the Equality and Human Rights Commission told us that the 10 yearly census remains the gold standard of equalities data. 
but the UK government had decided to reduce the amount of administrative data it collects. He said, and I quote, the situation in Scotland is particularly unhelpful because the ethnicity categories are collapsed into five when the data is gathered across 14 categories. That means that it's not possible to discern the distinctions between the outcomes for Pakistani, Bangladeshi or Indian people, which are quite stark if we're looking for nuanced policy. Similarly, Dr Alison Hosey of the Scottish Human Rights Commission spoke of the problem of carrying out analysis from a rights perspective on the currently available Scottish data sets, referring to the rights to health, housing, food and social security. She said trying to look at key aspects of those rights was extremely difficult owing to the lack of financial information in the budget that related to those particular spends. Now, in its response to us, the government pointed to a range of data sources, for example, the Scottish Survey's core questions, which covers a range of areas such as equality characteristics, housing and employment. It's new gender index that captures information on gender equality and on health, a new report measuring the use of health services by equality groups. The government acknowledged all public bodies need to do more and in 2017 produced an equality evidence strategy. This identifies the evidence gaps in equality's information. It's also updated the evidence, pardon me, equality evidence finder tool. And I would urge committees to make use of these tools and resources to help inform their scrutiny work so that together we can work towards filling the gaps and in doing so gain a clearer picture of equality's outcomes. The use of equality impact assessment is a um, continuous theme for the committee. We agree with the government that EQIAs are an invaluable tool for determining the impact of particular policies on protected characteristics. These assessments should be the backbone to policy development and underpin spending decisions. These should be drawing out issues of intersectionality, where a policy has a cumulative equality impact on, for example, people with a combination of protected characteristics, perhaps an older disabled man or a pregnant uh, Muslim woman. A recent strand of our work has focused on cumulative impact assessment and their use by local authorities. This can show where decisions across an authority have had an cumulative impact on certain groups in their communities and so help with budget setting. Also on cumulative impact, evidence from the Equality and Human Rights Commission highlighted the work they were undertaking with Landman Economics to develop better scrutiny of budget decisions taken by the UK government between 2010 and 2015. A report of this work is due to be published shortly. It will assess the potential impacts on different groups um, of changes to taxation, social security and public services up to 2022. Chris Oswald told us that this work has allowed the EHRC, and I quote, to identify that going forward, the largest losses will be for those in income decile two, for any family with more than three children and for lone parents. Those three groups will have the most significant losses. Black and Caribbean communities are the next most affected, and then it's people with severe disabilities. In terms of age, the most significant losses are among the 18 to 24 year old age group. The committee notes the Scottish Government's publication of its distributional analysis on income tax changes, which looked at changes to income group, age and disability. We welcome the Government's commitment to continue to explore, explore cumulative distributional analysis during this year and suggest that um, the Government might want to consider the work commissioned by EHRC and any lessons that can be learned from it. Presiding officer, and before I conclude, it would be remiss of me not to highlight the action being taken to identify human rights explicitly through the budget process. As such, the committee is pleased to see the inclusion of a human rights income and outcome in the Scottish Government's refreshed national performance framework. We respect, protect and fulfil human rights and we live free from discrimination. Now, the committee looks forward to the development of indicators in support this year. The committee is supportive of the development of human rights based budgeting in the Scottish budget system to ensure that Scotland is meeting its international and national human rights obligations, but recognise this will need to happen in a planned way. 
ensuring the right building blocks are put in place first. And we acknowledge that this may take time. In closing, um, Presiding Officer, I'd just like to leave with one key message, if I may. Scotland has previously been at the forefront of equality budgeting, and we must continue to lead. There is lots of innovative work going on across government and public bodies. It's absolutely essential that we all make the most of this work, of the information and the tools that we have available, so that we can all be assured of a solid connection between public policy making, resource allocation and stated equalities and human rights outcomes. Thank you. Margaret Mitchell, convener of the Justice Committee, followed by Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I state at the outset that I, I very much welcome the new pre-budget process and the opportunity it affords me as the convener of the Justice Committee and other conveners to set out their committee members' priorities and the issues which they have highlighted. The new, press, uh, the new process has, from the Justice Committee's perspective, worked well and ensured that during the year, the committee kept budgetary issues at the centre of much of our scrutiny of bills and inquiries. I thank my fellow Justice Committee members for their contributions to our pre-budget scrutiny this year and for the consensual way in which we reached our unanimous conclusions. I also thank the members of the Justice Subcommittee for Policing and its convener, John Finney, for its work on policing aspects of the justice budget. And pay tribute to the committee clerks for their invaluable assistance and support and to all the organisations and individuals who gave evidence to both committee, uh, committees as part of our budget scrutiny. The Justice Portfolio budget is a little over £2.7 billion, which equates to approximately 6.5% of the Scottish Government's total proposed budget for 2019-20. Whilst this is a relatively small percentage of the Scottish Government's budget, it's important to stress that justice portfolio spending decisions have potentially major consequences in terms of the protection of the public, the functioning of a fair justice system, and the effectiveness of our police and fire services, which means that these decisions are amongst the highest priorities of any government. The Justice Committee therefore focused on the following government plan spending. Funding for the Crown, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, funding for IT projects and in the justice sector, and funding for the third and voluntary sectors. I'll address each of these areas in turn starting with the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service. The smooth running of this service is fundamental to the effectiveness of Scotland's justice system, which is why the first inquiry carried out by the Justice Committee in the new 2016 session was into the functioning of the Crown Office. This was considered a priority as the Committee heard evidence at that time and for some considerable time before that the service was just about managing with its budget. So since then, the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service has for several years been the subject of the Justice Committee, Committee's budget scrutiny and also the monitoring of the Committee's inquiry recommendations. Consequently, additional funding of up to 3.6 million has been provided for the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service and 300,000 for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. In addition to this, the Committee is gratified that this, this continuity and scrutiny has led to 60 newly appointed COPFS staff who will be prosecutors, and that some of this additional 3.6 million COPFS funding has been provided to, to resources to help increase prosecutions of domestic violence and sexual offences. Deputy Presiding Officer, the COPF IT systems provide crucial services such as witness notification, the provision of real-time information on witness citations and case management. 
During a very worthwhile meeting, the deputy convener and I had with the Lord Advocate and the Crown Agent to discuss how they plan to use some of the 3.6 million additional funds. The need to improve these IT services was stressed. The committee considers it is vital to ensure that these IT systems are modernised, improved and linked seamlessly with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and Police Scotland to ensure the effective functioning of our justice system. And IT funding was more generally and specifically for policing the second area the Justice Committee focused on. In 2018, the SPA Board supported an online business case for a £298 million IT upgrade for Police Scotland over the next nine years. This is required to modernise existing systems and introduce new mobile devices to ensure our frontline officers have the technology they need. Whilst the additional 12 million in the draft budget for IT purposes is welcome, it falls far short of what's required and might reasonably have been expected given the challenges and potential dangers our officers face every day. The committee therefore welcomes the reassurances the Cabinet Secretary gave the subcommittee on the 17th of January when this was put to him to the effect that our police have to be given the tools for the job. In addition to this, both committees heard the SPA view that Police Scotland's current budget of £23 million was a disproportionately small capital grant for a body of its scale and importance. This has implications for fleet maintenance, where Police Scotland has confirmed it has the current overspend of around £6 million per year. However, while the Scottish Government is aware of this, there appear to be no extra funds for fleet and estate management provided for in this year's capital budget, which remains the same as 2018-19. The committee therefore again welcomes the Cabinet Secretary's reassurances to the subcommittee on policing that he will look at this before the next spending review. Finally, um, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Justice Committee pays tribute to the outstanding work of the many organisations that work in this portfolio. During the committee's scrutiny of the Scottish Government's Management of Offenders Bill, it was evident that the support from the voluntary sector when prisoners are released from prison, is critical to help with housing, employment and access to GP services. Worryingly, the committee, the committee also heard if these services are not available, joined up and properly resourced, then the result will almost certainly be to set up an ex-prisoner to fail and potentially return to prison. The Justice Committee therefore seeks to ensure these voluntary organisations are adequately funded. Quite simply, it considers this makes sense given imprisonment costs tens of thousands of pounds more than the cost of providing support services to prisoners on their release. And crucially, the Committee calls on the Government to consider multi-year funding which would help ensure the third and voluntary sectors can focus on the vital services they supply instead of being trapped in a continuous cycle of applications for funding. Here once again, the committee welcomes the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to continue to look for opportunities to move other victim support organisations to longer term funding cycles. However, the committee urges him to go further and expand this approach to funding, not just to those working um, in, uh, to help support victims, but to other voluntary and third sector organisations in the civil and criminal justice system as well. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, as the Parliament takes on more powers, the scrutiny work of its, committee become, of its committees become even more important. The Justice Committee and the subcommittee members call on the Cabinet Secretary to take on board our findings 
when finalising funding decisions for the COPFS, the Scotland IT projects and multi-funding uh, for the third and voluntary sector organisations working in the criminal and justice sectors, civil, criminal and justice sectors. In the meantime, both committees thank the Cabinet Secretary for Justice for the constructive way that he has engaged with members and look forward to working with him on the issues raised today in the coming months. Bob Doris, convener of the Social Security Committee, followed by James Dornan. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm speaking today as convener of the Social Security Committee and I welcome the opportunity to participate in this pre-budget debate. It's the first such debate as part of the revised budget process, as we know, and I'm sure it will help enlighten and both inform fellow parliamentarians, but more importantly, the wider public, about the scrutiny all committees give to financial matters here in this parliament. First, a bit of context. In April last year, the parliament unanimously passed the Social Security Scotland Act, paving the way for the Scottish Government to deliver newly devolved benefits to the people of Scotland. These benefits will form one part of what is a complex delivery of social security, with different agencies delivering different aspects of that system. The majority of social security benefits remain reserved to Westminster and are administered by the Department of Work and Pensions, and that includes the much debated universal credit, which will replace six legacy benefits, which are housing benefit, income support, income-based job seekers allowance, income-related employment support allowance, child tax credit, and working tax credit. And it's also worth noting that those two tax credits have previously been the responsibility of the HMRC. In addition, local authorities are responsible for discretionary housing payments and the Scottish Welfare Fund. The Department of Work and Pensions is paying carers allowance on behalf of the Scottish Government under an agency arrangement, and Social Security Scotland is currently paying a carers allowance supplement and best start grant pregnancy and baby payments. So a period of transition, which is also reflected in the 2019-2020 budget portfolio. For the first time, the Social Security budget has been set out separately from the Scotland Act implementation line, adding more clarity to the spending plans of the Scottish Government. In 2019-20, the Social Security budget will be £560 million. This consists of support for the programme of delivery and the administration of Social Security Scotland. From the £560 million, it is forecast that £435 million will be paid to the people right across Scotland. In relation to the Scottish Government budget for 2019-2020, there are several aspects of the budget which our committee would like to highlight, the first being the establishment of Social Security Scotland itself. Last October, members of the committee were delighted to have the opportunity to visit the agency's new headquarters in Dundee. We met with some of the recently recruited staff who talked enthusiastically about the challenge of setting up a new organisation from scratch. It was the same members of staff who helped to administer some of the first payments delivered in 2018, which were the Carers Allowance Supplement Payments, the Best Start Grant Pregnancy and Baby Payments. The committee was pleased to hear that the Best Start Grant Pregnancy and Baby received exceptional application numbers. That is a good thing. But with such a demand-led expenditure, the committee did ask the question of how the government would cope with greater than anticipated demand. The Cabinet Secretary has assured the committee that if demand was greater than expected, then all eligible people would still be paid, and the government was keeping, and I quote, an exceptionally close eye on any in-year budgetary pressure, something that the committee, of course, welcomes. In 2019-2020, Social Security Scotland will continue to expand its functions, delivering an estimated £56 million in benefits across the country. They're expected to deliver in that year elements of the Best Start Grant, Best Start Foods, Funeral Expense Assistance and the Young Carers Grant. In keeping with the spirit of the Social Security Act, the Scottish Government consulted on each of these forums of assistance. In order to contribute to these consultations, the committee heard evidence from stakeholders, charities and people with lived experience who are expected to receive these forums of assistance. These people told us about their personal circumstances and about the difficulties currently facing them. I would like to thank all of them for contributing to the work of our committee. The regulations for elements of Best Start Grant, Funeral Expense Assistance, have recently been laid and, and will be considered by the committee in due course. 
It's interesting to pick out some of the key points which the Scottish Government have highlighted. The funeral expense assistance, which will replace the current DWP funeral payment, will increase eligibility in Scotland by around 40%. It is forecast, and forecasts become very important, that in its first full year of operation, the Government will spend £6.3 million. That's 25% more than the DWP spent the equivalent benefit in 2017-2018. Under the Early Years Assistance Best Start Grant, two new grants will be added. The Early Learning Grant and the School Age Grant. The value of both grants is expected to be £250. So new forms of assistance continue to be proposed by the Scottish Government. And last week it opened its consultation on the Job Grant, a grant which aims to help meet the initial cost of starting work and to support the smooth transition into employment for young people on low incomes. The grant will consist of a one-off payment of either £250 or £400 if the young person is a parent. The government also confirmed that it was operating carers' allowance supplement by the rate of inflation as required under the Social Security Scotland Act. The government are using the Consumer Price Index CPI as its measure of inflation, meaning that in 2019-2020, this will increase the weekly rate by 2.3% to £8.70. The delivery of this form of assistance has been classed as Wave 1 by the Scottish Government and they expect to deliver this by the summer of 2019. Wave 2 will include some much meatier, larger projects such as uh, the disability-related benefits, the replacements uh, in Scotland of PIP and other forms of support for people with long-term illnesses, injuries or impairments. The delivery of benefits under Wave 2 is not included in this year's coming budget but the agencies continue to increase its capacity to be able to deal with them going forward. And this is reflected in the Social Security Scotland's operating budget, which has increased to 41.5 million. 20.1 million in staffing costs, 5.6 million ICT, and 4.2 million in facilities and property, and 11.6 million in other payments, including administration payments to the DWP for functions uh, delivered. So over the next four years, the Scottish Government estimates the implementation cost for Social Security Scotland will be around £308 million. That's between 2017-18 to 2020-21. The committee will continue to monitor the cost of implementation as part of our ongoing budget scrutiny. Uh, in terms of forecast, today our committee also met with the Scottish Fiscal Commission who explain their role and that the Scottish Fiscal Commission provide the forecast of expenditure to, cla to claimants for the Scottish Government's social security system, both for the year ahead and on a five-year estimate. There is a second set of forecasts in May a to accompany the Scottish Government's medium-term financial strategy. They also evaluate their forecast annually, and this is published in the autumn around the same time as the Scottish Government's fiscal framework outturn report. Given that the new Scottish social security system remains in its infancy, I suspect that this autumn our committee will, of course, be very interested to see how accurate forecasts have been. For instance, presiding officer, and I merely speculate, should take up exceed forecasts, how have these cost pressures been managed and what implications may there be for the following year's budget? Or indeed, if uptake is behind forecasts, then Will that impact on the following year's budget also, in terms of money then allocated uh, to the benefit itself, or to see an entitlement campaign to drive up uptake? There were three aspects that the committee members were asked to bear in mind when looking at uh, budget lines and cost pressures and what we might want to do in scrutiny in relation to the Social Security budget by the Fiscal Commission, and that is eligibility criteria, uptake, and the level of the benefit. Change any one of these things and you can dramatically change uh, the outturn in relation to monies paid and, and what you're trying to do as a, a policy outcome. So we will look at all this going forward. I must mention the Scottish Welfare Fund. The funds administered by Social Security Scotland are not the only Social Security payments made by the Scottish Government. The Scottish Welfare Fund is delivered by local authorities. The previous convener of this committee, Claire Adamson, had some concerns and the committee concerns that the welfare fund was high enough to meet the needs and demand out there within society. And they noted that the £33 million budget had not increased since its inception. Had it, had it been increased in the rate of inflation, it would today be £36 million. Our committee 
has got similar concerns about whether that budget will actually meet the demand out there across our local authorities and we're disappointed the Scottish Government have not agreed to that. One caveat on that, Presiding Officer, of course, is that the Scottish Welfare Fund does not spend all monies allocated towards it. So we have to ask the question why Borders only spends 64% of money allocated under the Scottish Welfare Fund, but Inverclyde spends 110%. They supplement it. So in conclusion, Presiding Officer, a whole range of new budget lines for the Social Security Committee to scrutinise. We are getting our baselines in this financial year and lots more scrutiny going forward as part of a rolling programme of this new budget scrutiny process. James Dornan, Convener of Local Government and Communities Committee, followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to get the chance to speak in this debate on behalf of the Local Government and Communities Committee. The Local Government and Housing Budget is vast. This year, the committee decided that they'd focus on three issues. One of these is the biggest spend within our remit, the Local Government Annual Settlement. Another is, in relative terms, a small spend, funding for housing adaptations for older and disabled people. Thirdly, the committee looked at thematic, cross-cutting issue, that of workforce planning and local authorities. We took evidence on all three issues, and I want to thank the witnesses for their expert input. Of course, some of this work dates from before I became convener in September, and indeed the committee's work this year builds on a body of evidence built up throughout this session. And I want to thank my colleagues on the committee, both past and present, for their hard work, and my predecessor, Bob Doris, who helped set these priorities during his time in the chair. So taking the three issues I mentioned in reverse order, I suspect that workplace planning and local government has become something of a Cinderella subject in terms of parliamentary scrutiny, and yet it is critically important. Tighter public finances and demographic changes, including the challenges of an aging population, are leading local authorities to ask big questions about how they organise their human resources to optimise delivery. Council workers, of course, are not merely resources, they're people, and any changes must take account of the human factor. Council workforces have shrunk over the last decades, and councils understandably wish to avoid compulsory redundancies. But one of the concerns the committee heard from witnesses was a perceived hollowing out of council workforces, with more senior and better paid staff accepting a nudge from management to move on in an effort to save money and understandably avoid those compulsory redundancies. However, the committee heard evidence that in many cases, this has turned out to be a false economy, with valuable experience lost for good. Signing off, so the underlying question the committee posed in a pre-budget letter to the Scottish Government was this. Where does the balance lie between respecting the autonomy of each council and recognising the government responsibility and strategic challenges? As we said in our letter, the balance of evidence suggests that there's a need for more work done at national level, data gathering, horizon scanning and decision making, and that the Scottish Government has a role to play in this. From the government's response, we're not totally convinced that they've yet fully engaged with this point. And of course, we must not forget that there is also plenty of scope for councils to exercise collective leadership. The underlying challenges in this area are not going away, so this dialogue is bound to continue. The committee's next step will be an evidence session on absenteeism in the local government workforce. I turn now to housing adaptations, making physical changes to homes to help elderly people and people with disabilities go on living there. Spending in this area is in global terms small, but as we all know from constituency cases, a far from insignificant issue. A good intervention can be transformative, vastly improving people's quality of life. It can also be a textbook example of spending to save. If we enable people to go on living at home when the only realistic alternative would be full-time care, the impact on the public purse is surely reduced, as well, of course, as making the quality of life better for the individual and family. So I know so there's, very much, there's much very good work already going on and if there are problems, it's important not to overstate them. However, let me signal a couple of related matters in relation to which the committee has shown a dogged interest. First, there's the frustration at the lack of progress in realising what the jargon calls a 10-year neutral approach. In plain English, it should not matter whether you're an owner-occupier, a private tenant, or in social housing. You should have an equal chance to get an adaptation done and done to the same standard. This is a long-standing government goal, but it's clear from the evidence that some tenures are still less equal than others, and it appears that it's tenants of RSLs who are most likely to lose out. 
It also appears that total demands in the RSL adaptation budget increasingly outstrips available funding. The committee wishes to see the Scottish Government do more work to cost the level of unmet demand on this budget line. The level of spending by integration joint boards, still relatively new bodies of course, is also somewhat opaque and there are question marks over how well they plan their services in this area. It's natural that some will perform better than others, that is what devolved decision making means in practice, but in the years ahead the committee would like to see evidence of good practice being shared and standards being driven up overall. We intend to take evidence on IGBs in the next financial year. I turn finally to the local government settlement. The public discussion that takes place each year in this budget line is a passionate one. The state of our care services, our public libraries, our roads, our refuse collection and our public spaces is important to us all. You may be a wee bit surprised to hear, that this, but, to hear this, but party politics occasionally strays into that debate. But let me outline what the committee has agreed on. We all accept that the past decade has been tough for public services, including local government. And clearly local government financing is impacted by the overall amount of money available in Scottish public finances, which in turn is impacted by the state of UK public finances. It's been said elsewhere that the era of austerity in the UK public finances is coming to an end. Let us hope so, but does this mean that next year's financial settlement signals the beginning of the end of a period of what the committee called in a pre-budget letter, doing more with less? Yes, say the Scottish Government. No, say Cosler. So for guidance, I turn to the SPICE briefing paper on the settlement, which states, on the same page, that the local government budget will increase by 2% and also decrease by 3.4%, both in real terms. So I hope that clears the matter up for you. But let me be clear, yes. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful to the, the member for, for giving way. And he's right that there are different ways of interpreting these figures. But he's also aware uh, that in their evidence to, to the committee, uh, Cosler described not only the reduction in the unring fence part of the local government budget, but also new national protections and new national priorities. They say they, this combined perfect storm will have a fundamental impact on the ability of local authorities to invest in people, places and what's generally called inclusive growth. Can the, the committee convener tell us whether his committee has heard from any local councils that don't share that deep concern about the impact on their local services if the budget is passed in its current form? James Dornan. We heard from a number of witnesses that accepted the fact that the, the local government were receiving what, what had the ability to access money which, which protected the budget, including the raising of, of council tax and, and other methods of being able to raise finance. So although they may well be complaining that the, the budget directly from the Cabinet Secretary wasn't to their liking, but they did accept that if you took all the opportunities to raise finance, that there was no drop in the budget. I will do. This is all getting very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Derek McCarthy. Would the committee convener um, remind the chamber, was it the case that the resources spokesperson for COSLA described uh, the priorities that Patrick Harvey has described as excellent priorities and priorities that COSLA and local government supports? James Dornan. The Cabinet Secretary is spot on. The COSLA did also say that they uh, did not want to go down the route of the mess that local authorities were in through funding in, uh, in England and uh, under the Westminster Government. <laughs> yes, yes, happy to. <laughs> Sorry, I, I did just uh, uh, Hold on just a minute. Apologies. <laughs> we're getting very, very close to time here. So if it's quite quick, Mr Doris. I'll be very brief. Would, would the convener recognise, as I used to when I chaired your committee, uh, that COSLA would always try to make the financial position of councils as bleak as possible and the Scottish Government as positive as possible and there's a balance to be struck. We need that balance within this debate. James Dornan. I appreciate that COSLA are there to represent the members as local authorities and therefore would make the best case that they possibly could for the local authorities. Uh, I'm surprised at this, actually. I thought this was going to be one of my quieter speeches. But, uh, yeah, well, it's, it's going to become that, if you could wind up, please. I will try my very <laughs> hardest to design officer. Uh, and uh, let me be clear that this is no criticism of the SPICE paper. It merely reflects the underlying confusion around local government financing. Paper carefully explains that whether you see a rise or a cut depends on how you classify new non-discretionary spending given to councils for specified purposes. 
In a letter published yesterday, the committee called on the Scottish Government to set out its own interpretation of what elements of local government spending are discretionary and which are ring fest and to work with local government sector to find a common language on this issue. I'm under no illusions that we can eliminate partisan disagreement about local government spending, and I'm not sure we should even try. But when politicians get stuck in semantic arguments about accounting points, about whether a cut is actually a rise or a rise is actually a cut, it's about that time that the public reaction is to switch off and go and watch Coronation Street. So even for that reason alone, it would benefit us all to have a bit more clarity about the meaning of protected and discretionary spending in future, and more reassurance that even where they can't agree, central and local government are speaking the same language and we, uh, and we look forward to the government's response on this issue. Finally, President Officer, I'd, I'd like to f finish by thanking all my clerks and the other support staff for all their help to both the committee and me as a convener. Thank you. Well done. Move on to Jenny Mara, uh, convener of Public Audit, sorry, Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee who will be followed by Colin Beattie, and I understand it's an agreed six minutes, Ms. Mara. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking uh, the clerks of my committee for all the work they do throughout the year. Um, it's very much appreciated by me and all our members. The role of the Public Audit Committee is to examine whether public funds are spent wisely and to hold to account those who are charged with spending taxpayers' money. Our committee undertakes this work primarily through its scrutiny of reports prepared by the Auditor General for Scotland. And as a result, the Audit Committee traditionally has had little direct involvement in the budget scrutiny process, focusing instead on how and whether spending decisions um, are good and are wise and whether policy is delivered. However, the shift in the Parliament's new budget process to an outcomes-based approach suggests that in future there may be a unique role for our committee in supporting subject committees in their budget scrutiny and that is why I'm speaking today. The budget process review group noted that an outcomes-based scrutiny approach provides a means for evaluating the economic and social outcomes being achieved by public spending and involves bringing financial and performance information together so that the impact of spending decisions can be better understood. The committee has regularly emphasised in its audit scrutiny that there should be a clear link between what public money is being spent on and the outcomes that it delivers. However, there are three aspects today I'd like to highlight. Inputs and out outcomes, better data and the need for an explicit link between public spending and the national performance framework. Now on inputs and outcomes. Despite the long-standing commitment to an outcome-based approach, the audit reports that we receive still suggest that performance of many public services is still measured in terms of inputs rather than outcomes. For example, the Auditor General's 2018 report on early learning and childcare indicated that the Scottish Government did not set out what specific outcomes the expansion to 600 hours of funded ELC was intended to achieve. Now that leads to better data. The new budget process emphasises the need for better performance reporting to provide a clearer focus on the delivery of outcomes. Now this includes better information about what activity public spending will support, its aims and the contribution it expects to make to national outcomes. However, a number of reports from the Auditor General have suggested that data to demonstrate improved outcomes or progress towards longer term reforms is something that's often completely absent or underdeveloped. Again, to cite the report on early learning and childcare, that the Auditor General concluded there that the Scottish Government had not planned how to evaluate the impact of the 600 hours expansion. And while the Auditor General's 2017 progress report on self-directed support stated that data should have been developed earlier in the life of the strategy in order to measure the progress and impact of the strategy and the legislation. Finally, the explicit link between the national performance framework and the government's individual policies and strategies, its detailed spending proposals and the agreed national outcomes is not always evident. Let me give another example. Audit Scotland has noted that while the national performance framework measures progress towards economic targets and outcomes, it does not measure the contribution of policies and initiatives to delivering these outcomes. 
And in her recent report on the 1718 Scottish Government Consolidated Accounts, the Auditor General noted that, as with previous years, the accounts did not report on the performance of individual portfolios or the Scottish Government as a whole, limiting anyone's ability to see the Government's own contribution to the national outcomes. This, again, is something that needs to be addressed if we are going to have confidence in the system. Now, the Budget Process Review Group report indicated that Parliament's committees are able to draw on a basket of evidence on the intended impact of policies and public spending and the effect these are having. They noted that this will be a key part of how the Parliament committees evaluate public spending and how they seek to influence the formulation of future spending proposals. The Budget Group concluded that there was scope for committees to make better use of audit reports as part of this basket of evidence to support their evaluation of public spending. Whilst individual subject committees will continue to have a key interest in how well specific policies and programmes are being delivered, the Audit Committee is well placed to offer an overarching perspective on how effectively the Government is deliver, delivering improved outcomes overall for the people of Scotland. How and in what form that support might take is something I would be keen for the Audit Committee to explore with subject committees following the completion of the, this first year of the new process. Uh, we move to the last of the convener speeches and it's uh, Colin Beatty, the Scottish Commission for Public Audit. Again, an agreed six minutes. Presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity to take part in this debate on behalf of the Scottish Commission for Public Audit. And I would firstly like to thank the clerks for their work in preparing our report of 21st January. Excuse me, Mr. Beatty, um, something wrong with your microphone. Can you check your card or stick it up in the air? Well Sorry, done. I had it uh, pushed <laughs> <laughs> if you would start, start again, I'll please, start again. Mr. Peter. President Officer, I welcome the opportunity to take part in this debate on behalf of the Scottish Commission on Public Audit. And I would firstly like to thank the clerks for their work in preparing our report of 21st January. The Commission was established under the Public Finance and Accountability Act, Scotland Act 2000, and its membership consists of five MSPs, including myself as chair. One of the Commission's main areas of responsibilities is to examine Audit Scotland's proposals for the use of resources and expenditure and report on them to Parliament. Audit Scotland is an independent body that carries out audits on public entities to ensure best value and efficiency. Their work covers more than 220 organisations, with these entities spending about £40 billion of public money annually. In previous years, the Commission has reported on its scrutiny of Audit Scotland's annual budget proposal to the Finance and Constitution Committee. However, following the report of the Budget Review Group in June 2017, the Commission now reports directly to the Scottish Parliament. Audit Scotland's budget forms part of the total Scottish budget, and the Commission's report, published last Monday, therefore supports the Parliament's wider scrutiny of the budget for 2019-20. Audit Scotland's budget is drawn from two main sources. The first source, which makes up around 75% of its total budget, is from the fees that it charges audited bodies for their annual audit work. The second source of Audit Scotland's budget is the monies approved by the Scottish Parliament from the Scottish Consolidated Fund. This year, Audit Scotland is seeking £7.564 million from the Scottish Consolidated Fund, which is an increase of £416,000 on last year's total resource requirement of £7.148 million. The budget proposal from Audit Scotland, provided in December 2018, broadly funds activities carried out by Audit Scotland, such as performance audits, the National Fraud Initiative, and the new financial powers that are in the process of being devolved to Scotland. The budget proposal notes that it has been prepared in the context of a number of significant uncertainties, such as the impact of the UK autumn budget statement on Scottish budgets, the Scottish Government's public sector pay policy, and the impact of the United Kingdom leaving the EU. The UK is moving rapidly towards its exit from the European Union on March 29, and Brexit carries with it unknown risks and implications, especially for the public sector. As such, work for this fiscal year will likely increase as the UK exit strategy becomes clearer, and as a result, Audit Scotland may have to hire more employees. Accordingly, the budget proposal also contains a request to double the management contingency from £150,000 to £300,000. 
The reasons for this, given by the Auditor General at the Commission's report on 12th December, are that it's a direct response to the uncertainty we're now facing, given the extent of that uncertainty that we're facing with regard to not just the work that we might need to carry out, but what the impact might be on our costs in future. We therefore propose to increase the contingency to £300,000. As members will see from our report, Audit Scotland has a three-year phased approach to resourcing the audit needs of the new financial powers. We looked at this approach for the first time last year and again this year. This year's budget proposal highlights the additional work requirements arising from the financial and performance work which is required to be undertaken on Social Security Scotland. The budget proposal stated Social Security Scotland began operating as an executive agency on 1st September 2018 and will be responsible for delivering 10 devolved benefits totaling around 3.3 billion of spending annually. Audit Scotland is the appointed auditor for the agency and its payments and as such has a new team to lead on all financial and performance audit work on Social Security. The Commission recognises that the devolution of further financial powers will result in an increased workload for Audit Scotland and considers that its proposed increase of £285,000 to fund people costs is appropriate. It will meet the requirements of the phased transfer of the new financial powers to Scotland. Additionally, part of VAT receipts will be assigned to the Scottish Budget from April this year. Audit Scotland will be working closely with the National Audit Office to ensure a managed VAT assignment to the Scottish Parliament. Audit Scotland will also be working closely with the National Audit Office and the Scottish Income Tax. This will provide for increased assurance to the Scottish Parliament and HMRC's administration of different tax bans and rates for Scottish taxpayers. We note in our report that there are some signs that performance and audit quality has fallen. Audit Scotland's budget provides £250,000 to address this, with Audit Scotland confirming it is increasing its learning and development work to tackle the concerns raised during its audit quality annual report. The Commission will in future look to see how effective that budget is in improving audit quality. The Scottish budget is linked to economic performance. As such, Audit Scotland will need to build capacity to oversee the reporting of fiscal management and financial sustainability. And this will help Parliament in our maintenance of scrutiny. Last year and again this year, we also looked at Audit Scotland's fee strategy. In this year's budget proposal, while the costs of auditing NHS bodies and education bodies remain broadly the same as in 2018-19, the cost of the audit of local authorities has increased by 4.2% or £483,000. Audit Scotland has explained that this is because local government meets all the costs of its audit work and the increased costs seen this year have arisen from the increased number of local government bodies now being audited. Furthermore, the integrated joint boards have increased in size as they have begun to take on their full responsibilities. Having considered and reported on Audit Scotland's budget proposal, the Commission has agreed to recommend to Parliament that Audit Scotland's budget proposal for 2019-20, including the request for a total resource requirement of £7.564 million be approved. That concludes the convener's contributions. We now move to the winding up speeches. Disappointing to note that there are some conveners absent from the chamber. And first of all, call Kate Forbes for eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to start at the outside by thanking committee conveners not only for their contribution to today's debate, but also for their um, budget scrutiny and the way that they've led their committees over the course of the last few weeks and months. And today's debate is, of course, one of the recommendations and part of the implementation of the Budget Process Review Group. And that revised budget approach was structured around um, the following framework, which has been touched on by some of the committee conveners, that it would be a, a full year approach with a broader process in which committees would have the flexibility to incorporate budget scrutiny, a continuous cycle, that scrutiny should be continuous, not just one off when it comes to the budget itself. Critically, and Jenny Mara touched on this in her own contribution, that it would be outcome focused, that scrutiny should be evaluative with an emphasis on what budgets have achieved and aim to achieve over the long term, that it would be fiscal responsibility, that scrutiny should have a long term outlook and focus more on prioritisation. And lastly, and most interestingly perhaps from today's debate, that it should be interdependent. 
that scrutiny should focus more on the interdependent nature of many of the policies which the budget is seeking to deliver. And I think uh, a debate like today, whilst um, two and a half hours of, of different subject areas demonstrates the ways in which different committees do have an interdependence on each other. And I hope that uh, committee conveners certainly felt that they were able to lead on that upfront scrutiny rather than it just as Edward Mountain mentioned being post uh, budget uh, draft um, being, being published. The debate today also shows the huge breadth of budget spend and priorities in areas of education, health, infrastructure, justice, transport, environment and many other areas. And whilst there's no doubt a range of views when it comes to spend priorities, and indeed there will be ample time, no doubt, with debates in the next few weeks to debate and discuss those spend priorities, there is nevertheless, I think, a lot of agreement on the importance of outcomes, and indeed a lot of agreement on the outcomes that we all seek. And rather than fixate on, on the numbers, as important as they are, there is an importance there in looking at the ways in which those numbers have an impact on people. Now, I can't, and I'm, I'm sure you're delighted to hear this, can't respond to all the points that have been raised in the debate today. I'll leave that to the next speaker, who is no doubt scribbling furiously. Um, I, I know that uh, the government has responded to, or for, uh, responses will be forthcoming to uh, committee letters. And I do want to touch on all the committees that have uh, talk, uh, contributed today. And I want to do that in the context of these outcomes. And if I take education to start off with, we of course want young people to achieve their best in this country. We want them to be able to access the same opportunities no matter where they're from, no matter where they live, and no matter what they want to achieve. And the draft budget invests near over £180 million to close the poverty-related attainment gap, which was mentioned um, in the speech earlier, which includes £120 million for head teachers to spend on closing the attainment gap. We want our young people um, to have those opportunities at an early age. And so there is £210 million of resource in the draft budget and a total of £500 million that goes on uh, nursery buildings and nursery staff. We recognise the specific challenges too and are providing £12 million for mental health provision. Moving on to economy and fair work, um, and Gordon Lindhurst's contribution. We want to see a healthy economy. We want to see businesses growing and thriving. We want to see jobs being created and people in this country enjoying a steady, fair wage. We want jobs to be fair. There are, of course, economic challenges ahead. And so that's why the draft budget invests in the economy, which includes a new £50 million fund for town centres to drive local economic activity and stimulate place based improvements. One of the things that I was most delighted to see in the draft budget is a new £1 million digital start fund to ensure that those that are furthest from the digital workforce get the support they need, whether that's women returning to work um, or those from, from more disadvantaged backgrounds. Moving on to culture and Joan McAlpine, we of course want to celebrate our historic environment, we want to promote our tourism industry and we want to support cultural organisations. So this will be the second year where there's £6.6 .6 million of additional funding to enable Creative Scotland to maintain support for their regular funding programme. And Joe McAlpine also mentioned the hub offices eh, across the world. And it is hugely important now more than ever that we are outward looking as a country and as a government. Moving on to health and uh, Lewis MacDonald, um, we want people to access free health care, free health services at the point of need. And we need to drive reform, particularly in light of the demographic challenges, which Bruce Crawford touched on. And then that again shows the importance of actually pulling a lot of that um, budget scrutiny uh, and discussing the challenges that we face um, across different areas. But of course, we need to invest wisely. And the budget transforms the NHS with um, £730 million of additional investment in health and social care. But it's right that um, committees scrutinise where that is spent. We're extending free personal care and we're increasing direct investment in mental health to £1.1 billion. But again, Lewis MacDonald touched on the importance of long-term budget planning. And here, perhaps more than anywhere else, is the importance of targeting our investment wisely. 
Moving on to the environment uh, and Gillian Martin, we need to play our role in mitigating and adapting to climate change, to caring for the planet and using our resources, not just our financial resources, but our other resources wisely. And the budget includes £20 million for Zero Waste Scotland to help support that transition towards a more resource efficient circular economy and over £145 million investment in energy efficiency, fuel poverty and heat decarbonisation. And here, perhaps more than anywhere, we see the importance of preventative spend for seeing the economic benefits, the health benefits of targeting our investment wisely when it comes to the environment portfolio. And there's a clear overlap of budgets. Moving swiftly on to rural economy and Edward Mountain's contribution, um, I certainly agree with him that we want people living in rural areas to have the same opportunities, the same services, the same level of infrastructure as anybody in this country. And there are, of course, particular sectors, agriculture, forestry, seafood, that we need to support and invest in because they, perhaps more than others, are facing the challenges with, um, with Brexit. And the committee's focus on uh, ferry transport is something I certainly uh, endorse and the importance of investing in ferries. Moving swiftly on, presiding officer, to Social Security and, and Bob Doris, we have transformed and we are transforming the landscape for Social Security benefits in Scotland to deliver a system which treats people with dignity, fairness and respect. And the budget provides £435 million of direct assistance through our social security interventions, including over £100 million to support those on low incomes and to continue, as we have been doing now for some years, to mitigate the hugely unfair bedroom tax and UK welfare cuts. Moving on to justice, Margaret Mitchell, portions of access to justice, law courts, policing, which are indeed the foundation stones of our society to ensure that nobody is deprived of that access to, judge it, to justice. And the budget includes £18 million to support victims of crime and tackle violence against women and girls. Equalities in human rights, and Ruth Maguire touched, I thought, quite eloquently on the way in which equalities in human rights have to be embedded in every um, portfolio. And, presiding officer, I could go on, but I'm going to stop now because I realise time is of the essence. In a nutshell, I think it's been a very helpful debate, um, and I hope it helps um, with uh, committees that are trying to drive and be at the forefront of that budget scrutiny. Perfect time. Uh, I now move to Adam Tompkins, uh, Vice Convener of the Finance Committee, to close the debate. Around nine minutes will take us up to decision. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding uh, Officer, and it's my pleasure to close this debate on behalf of uh, the uh, Finance Committee. I'd like to start where the Convener of the Committee, um, my friend Bruce Crawford, started, which is to thank uh, our clerks who um, serve us. It's clear from this afternoon's debate that all committees across the Parliament are well served by their clerks, but none more so, I think, than the Finance uh, and Constitution Committee, and we are very much in their, in their debt. As we have heard, presiding officer, this afternoon's debate is one part, an important part, of the uh, new process of budget scrutiny, which, among other things, was designed to bring this Parliament's subject committees much more to the forefront in the year-round process uh, of budget scrutiny, with at least the following three aims in mind. First, that there should be uh, greater parliamentary influence over the government's budget priorities and decisions. Secondly, that there should be fuller transparency with regard to the budget uh, process. And third, that there should be a sharper focus on better outputs and better outcome outcomes of spending decisions. Um, and as the convener said in his opening remarks, this requires, as much as anything else, a change in our culture, a change in our culture so that politically we focus not just on uh, short-term numbers, but on long-term uh, outcomes, both in government and in opposition. And it's clear from what we've heard this afternoon that this has uh, been uh, something, uh, an, an enterprise which has been shared seriously uh, by committees right across um, the portfolio uh, spectrum, not least in health, where Lewis MacDonald, on behalf of the committee that he convenes, said that the Health and Sport Committee has been in the vanguard of the revised budget scrutiny uh, process, especially as regards transparency and the transparency of the budgets of health boards uh, and integrated, uh, joint integrated boards. But where he warned us in what I thought was a very striking um, remark, that even integrated authorities who are statutorily required to report to Parliament uh, on their budgets in a matter that directly links them to outcomes are poor at doing so, not necessarily failing to do so, but struggling to do so, which is, I think, pause for thought, not just for the health 
uh, committee, but for all of us. And as I said, presiding officer, it's clear that there's been serious engagement with this process right across the parliament, but there have also been some concerns expressed this afternoon by one or two conveners of uh, committees, Edward Mountain perhaps most notably uh, um, warning us that we shouldn't be naive in terms of what we can uh, expect from uh, the input uh, of committees into this, into this process. Um, I don't want to go through committee by committee what we've heard uh, this afternoon, uh, presiding officer, but I do want to draw out, if I may, two or three themes from a number of the contributions that caught, that caught my ear. Um, and that I think will require us to think a little bit further and deeper. One of them was just referred to by the Minister, Kate Forbes, in her closing remarks on behalf of the government, and that is the theme of preventive spend. Now, preventive spend is something which the Christie Commission told us a long time ago we needed to do much more of in Scotland, and notwithstanding the recommendations of the uh, Christie Committee, and uh, notwithstanding the fact that all political parties accepted and endorsed those recommendations, it's still something in Scotland which we're, which we're really not very good at. And I think we have to have an honest conversation in Scotland about why our parliamentary politics is not very good at delivering effective preventive spend. And one of the reasons why we're not very good at it is because it's sometimes difficult to see the results of effective preventive spend within an election cycle. Now, I passionately believe in parliamentary democracy. I much prefer parliamentary democracy to its other, to democracy's other forms, to direct uh, democracy, but that's a debate perhaps for another day. I passionately believe in parliamentary democracy, but one of the flaws of parliamentary democracy is that we think that we need to see results within a parliamentary cycle. This is not a plea for fewer elections. This is not a plea for longer parliamentary cycles. It is a plea for what Bruce Crawford referred to as a change of culture so that we accept, both in government and in opposition, that effective parliamentary spend is not necessarily going to yield visible or tangible results within the lifetime of a single parliament. I thought Gillian Martin spoke very... Can I just give two examples, and then I'll happily give way to the minister. I thought Gillian Martin spoke very interestingly about this in the context of um, the environment and the, what she had to say about health walks, about active travel, about air quality, and about stress and the relationship between those uh, aspects. And I thought uh, Margaret Mitchell also talked about it very uh, effectively in the context um, of the work that the Justice Committee has been doing. And again, another interesting example of what Margaret Mitchell had to say is that she, she said that the Justice Committee's bill scrutiny of the management of offenders bill is something where their work on budgetary scrutiny is to the forefront. So there's a direct relationship between the bill scrutiny work of that committee and thinking about the budget in, in, in a, in a year-round way. But what she said was that it is evident from the, from the evidence that that committee has received that without adequate resourcing, our management of offenders is doomed to fail. Um, and it needs to be joined up, it needs to be properly resourced, otherwise the potential for ex-offenders simply to return to prison and to cost much more to the public purse um, will, will simply be there. Happily to give way to the Minister if she still wants to Kate intervene. Forbes. Just a genuine question on preventative spend from a committee perspective. For it to work, it has to happen on a cross-committee basis and committees being willing to recognise that a budget line might need to go elsewhere. How does he see that happen for a committee perspective? Adam Tompkins. I think that's a very interesting question, and it was one of the challenges. Later in my remarks, I want to talk about one or two of the challenges that I think have been posed by this afternoon's uh, contributions. And one of the challenges that's been posed by this afternoon's contributions uh, is exactly that. I think you referred to it, uh, Minister, as interdependence in your remarks a few moments ago. Um, again, there are a couple of very interesting examples of this, of where spend spending to be effective has to be understood to be cross-portfolio. So if we have um, commit subject committees which are focused on individual uh, portfolios, how can we ensure that either the budget decisions or the spending decisions in, the, in those portfolios are effective? And two examples I thought were very striking. First, what Claire Adamson had to say um, uh, about the relationship, the very complex and extraordinarily important relationship between child poverty and education policy. And the second example, again, from what Gillian Martin had to say about the importance of environmental education. Are these issues for the Social Security Committee? Are they for the Education Committee? Or for the, are, they, are they for the Environment Committee? And the answer, of course, is that they are for all of these committees. And one of the things that I think we, might, we perhaps might need to see as we go forward with this process is more effective joined up working between committees. That happens increasingly in the House of Commons. I think we might want to see it uh, in this uh, parliament as well. And it might address uh, the remarks there that the minister just made. A second theme that I wanted briefly to allude to before I finish, presiding officer, um, was made um, quite strikingly in Gordon Lindhurst's comments uh, uh, from the Economy Committee. And that is not about the importance of preventive spend, but the effectiveness of spend. And he asked a very interesting question, which the ministers uh, responding, I don't think, uh, with respect, referred to. And he said this, for every pound spent, 
by the enterprise agencies, we are told, between £6 and £9 is added to the value of the Scottish economy. That's a brilliant example of the, effect of the effectiveness of spend. Yet their budget, we were told, has been cut over the last decade of SNP administrations. So this is an example of the kind of long-term economic planning uh, and the emphasis on the effectiveness of spend and on outcomes, as the convener said, that we need to focus on uh, as we go forward. Um, to conclude, presiding officer, um, I think we have heard this afternoon that there are a number of challenges as we go forward in budget process. Challenges both for the future review of the fiscal framework, which the convener referred to in his opening remarks, and challenges also for the Scottish Government, whoever the Scottish Government is uh, at, at, at the material time. Challenges for the fiscal framework include the management and allocation of volatility, uncertainty and risk. We all know that there is increased volat volatility, volatility, uncertainty and risk uh, in the Scottish budget. The question is, is that risk fairly allocated between the Scottish Government and other institutions in the United Kingdom? And one aspect of that, which we heard quite a lot about this afternoon, is the relevance and importance to the budget um, of relative population decline uh, on the health of Scotland's public services and the added risk that Brexit poses to that. So those are challenges for the future of the fiscal framework that I think from this afternoon's debate the Parliament will want to take forward uh, in the future. Challenges for the Scottish Government, uh, as underscored in the Finance Committee's uh, pre-budget scrutiny report, are first, of course, ongoing subdued growth relative to the rest of the United Kingdom. And secondly, something which we haven't heard very much about this afternoon, but which has been absolutely central to the Finance Committee's consideration of this year's budget, which is the much lower number of, of higher and additional rate income taxpayers in Scotland than had initially been forecast. Whoever the government is, these are challenges which are going to have to be taken seriously going forward. Presiding officer, as I've said before in this chamber, we are entering a new period of devolution in which our parliament is responsible for raising much of the revenue to fund our public services. And that requires us all to rise to the challenge of using these new, these new powers wisely and to manage the inevitable risks with a pragmatic and reasonable approach. Presiding officer, can I finish by echoing Bruce Crawford's view set out at the beginning of this debate that the biggest challenge we face is cultural. Let's allow our politics to mature with a clear focus on outcomes and on what we are seeking to achieve rather than arguing only about numbers, notwithstanding how important numbers can sometimes be. I therefore support the motion in the convener's name. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on committee's budget scrutiny. And we're going to turn straight to decision time. And there's only one question this evening. And the question is that motion 15421, in the name of Bruce Crawford, on committee's budget scrutiny, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>